met Dr. Linus Pauling and was so impressed with him that he composed a poem in his honor, and I'm sure the respect was mutual. He returned to India to join the Department of Physics at IIC Bangalore, and then shifted to the University of Madras as its first professor and head in the Department of Physics there. Professor Ramachandran's work, along with Dr. Gopinath Kartha, on the triple helical structure of collagen is well known. And in order to convince the unconvinced of the feasibility of the proposed structure, he came up with the phi psi plot, which is now more popularly referred to as the Ramachandran plot in all biochemistry textbooks. So we are indeed fortunate enough to have with us speakers for whom using the term galaxy of speakers will probably not be an exaggeration. In the interest of time, I request members of the audience to please type in any questions that they may have in the message box along with their email address and we will uh, then convey them to the speaker. I uh, request Professor Dulal Panda, our director, to say a few words and we will then start with the program. Good morning and good evening to all. I'm really delighted that we are fortunate to organize this webinar. Professor G. N. Ramachandran was a man of extraordinary caliber. He's the uh, you know jewel in the crown on the crown of Indian science. He was born on October 8, 1922, and in near Cochin, the town called Irnapura. And he made India in the map of molecular biophysics. So his contribution is beyond description. He was also an extraordinary organizer. He founded two different departments. He was a poem. So uh, I think uh, I will not get into the description of this. Only thing that probably say that it's very difficult to imagine such a person and it's a man of a man who actually made India proud in the area of molecular biophysics. With this, I actually want to invite all the four eminent speakers uh, who have kindly agreed uh, to give you the talk. And the first speaker is Professor George Rose and uh, uh, Ipsita Roy. Professor Ipsita Roy will introduce Professor George Rose. Thank you. So our first speaker today is Professor George D. Rose. Professor Rose has been the Krieger Eisenhower Professor Emeritus, JHU Academy Professor, and Research Professor at Johns Hopkins University since, 19, 20, uh, since 2014. Before that, he was the chairman of the same department for a remarkable 12 years. The students in the audience may find it of interest that Professor Rose obtained his master's degree in mathematics and computer science after which he obtained his PhD in biochemistry and biophysics, both from Oregon State University. Professor Rose has won several honors and distinctions, not only within the United States, but in other countries as well. He is an elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and has received an honorary doctorate of science from Bard College. He has also been recognized for his work by TU München, Germany, and the Weizmann Institute Student and Fellows Council itself. He is a recipient of the Humboldt Research Award. Professor Rose has worked extensively on the protein folding problem in an attempt to answer the seemingly innocuous question, why do proteins fold? I will also like to inform Professor Rose here that the universal theory of stabilization of peptide backbone by osmolites based on fractional polar surface area proposed by him and his group is a part of the course on protein structure that is here at our institute. So it is an honor for me to invite Professor Rose to share his thoughts with us today. So Professor Rose. Thank you very much. Let me turn this on. All it says is stop sharing. I want to share my screen. There we go.
Good. Can you see that? Yes, we yes. it. Very good. So thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this celebration. It's a privilege to do so. I'm going to talk a little bit about GNR, but then I'd really like to underscore GNR's um, influence on not only protein folding in general, but more specifically on the work that I myself have done, much of it, strongly influenced by him. So the early work that he had done um, on collagen, and here are references, um, was criticized by Alex Rich and Francis Crick, who were also working on the structure of collagen at the time. Um, and they criticized his stereochemistry. And here is um, GNR, and he had modeled collagen as a triple helix, which indeed it is. Um, the, the model did have a stereochemical problem, but nevertheless, it was essentially correct. And in fact, Rich and Crick um, did not have a structure that was essentially correct. Um, but in any case, he took this criticism of his stereochemistry very much to heart. And that led several years later to the famous plot. And there is the plot. Um, I'm sure everybody there knows it. Uh, that plot appears at the beginning of essentially every textbook on biochemistry these days. Um, and one of the things you notice about the plot, the, the, the dark green is, and light green represents two different van der Waals radii. It is a plot for the allowed phi psi angles for a, uh, an alanine dipeptide. He called it a dipeptide. Um, it's really a blocked monopeptide. And what you'll notice is that just from sterics alone, most of phi psi space is disallowed. What's phi psi space? Those are internal coordinates. And those internal coordinates were in fact developed by Ramachandran, Ramakrishnan, and Sashashekaran. So sterics, at least for the Ramachandran dipeptide, has eliminated about 75% of available phi psi space, simply because two atoms can't be at the same place at the same time unless they're bonded to one another. This plot, um, very simple, it's just two dimensions. Um, today is used to validate experiments instead of the converse. So typically what happens is that if your theory disagrees with the experiment, the theory must be wrong. Not so for the Ramachandran plot. When the experiment disagrees with the theory, if you have, if you solve a structure and there are phi psi angles in this disallowed region, you question what you've done. So it's one of the very few theories in biological chemistry for which this is true. I also want to mention um, Ramakrishnan, who did a year, basically a year's work. He was a student of, of Ramachandran and basically a year's work in order to develop these phi psi angles, the allowed and disallowed regions in the phi psi plot. What you see here is his PhD project. Um, that would be to develop something like that these days. That would be a homework assignment. You do it overnight. Not so at the time that he did it. So in 1965, especially without a computer, this was done by a calculator and it took him basically a year. And there's a very nice description of all of this by Ramakrishnan's student in Srinivasan. Um, the student behind the Ramachandran map. 
and regrettably, um, Srinivasan died um, very recently at much too young an age. So let me tell you just a little bit about how I met GNR. Um, initially, I met him intellectually. I was getting a PhD. At the time that I was getting my PhD, one had to uh, pass a language requirement. And so my language requirement was in French. You had to be able to read French. And my advisor, who was Ken Van Hold, gave me a paper by Pullman and Pullman on the sphere rigide. Um, and I not only translated the paper, but I found it absolutely fascinating. So in 1977, GNR was a Fogarty scholar at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda. And I really wanted to meet him in person. And so I made an appointment to see him. I was nearby in Delaware at the time. And I drove there to see him. And he was a rather imperious person. And by the time we had been together for five minutes or so, um, he gave me a homework assignment. Uh, typically, I don't respond well to people who tell me this is what you must do. Uh, but I found myself um, feeling as though really, I, I, if he wanted me to do that, I would do it. Um, he was an impressive person. He had a, a dipeptide, a large model of a dipeptide. It was on a ring stand and he had large uh, muscles in his forearms and he could manipulate the phi psi angles by unscrewing a screw and moving them around and screwing the screw back. Um, and he could do it at lightning speed. It was impressive to see it. So I did my homework assignment and I must say, that that work um, so fascinated me that it's become part of what I do and has continued that way for the last 50 years. So I'd like to now focus on what has really become a, a, a difference in the way people think about protein folding, the focus on attractive forces, or excluding forces. What's an excluding force? A force that is disfavored and therefore it's excluded from the thermodynamic population. A steric clash is disfavored and conformers with steric clashes will be, if not eliminated, will be very rare in the overall thermodynamic population. So attractive forces. It's a kind of what you see is what you get force. Basically, the way people are trying to model this or people do model this is that you use a force field which, in which you represent the various terms that you think are important. And then for a particular conformation of the protein, you can um, calculate what this contribution to the energy is for each pair and some over all pairs. And that gives you the energy of the protein. And then you move to a different conformation and you can do it all again. That's time consuming. It's not as time consuming now as it used to be uh, with faster computers and way of doing, ways of doing this. But there have been a number of attempts to do kind of shortcuts, um, contact energies, knowledge-based potentials. What's a knowledge-based potential? You look at proteins of known structure, you look a lot of, at a lot of them, you look at the interactions or the, yeah, the interactions between different pairs of residues in this database of proteins. You weight them properly and you decide whether, let's say a valine really likes to be next to a leucine more than you would expect by chance alone. And that becomes a kind of potential, but it's extracted from empirical data. Go models, lattice models. And the whole idea behind that is that these attractive forces are the ones that select this particular conformation, which happens to be an all atom depiction of ribonuclease. 
about 2,000 atoms here. And you look at that conformation and you say, why this conformation rather than any other? And the underlying thought is, well, the interactions between and among these atoms are more favorable than the interactions between and among the same atoms when you're in any other conformation from ribonuclease, and that's what selects this native state. If that's the case, what that means is that when you fold the protein, the interactions between and among the atoms that have selected this conformation are visible in the final structure. And so you can extract them by looking, by analyzing, which is exactly what happens in, in these different kinds of approaches. So those are attractive interactions. I call them what you see is what you get. What you see here um, is the interactions that were responsible for forming this structure. Now, excluding interactions are kind of the opposite. Excluding interactions are disfavored interactions. They will, if there are, if a, a protein, for example, uh, adopts a conformation in which there's a steric clash, that will be highly unfavorable. And the, those with steric clashes would be eliminated from the thermodynamic population. They would contribute negligibly to the overall thermodynamic population. And the Ramachandran plot is basically excluding interactions, it's sterics. And about the same time, um, Pauling had developed CPK models. CPK models, you represent each atom as a sphere with the appropriate, um, with, with a scale to the van der Waals radius of that atom. So this is a CPK model, although it's computer generated. The original CPK models were made out of wood. And CPK models are also steric. So this kind of idea of modeling things with sterics, that was in the air. So the current paradigm has really focused hard on attractive interactions. Um, going back to the Anfinson hypothesis. And Anfinson here in, you know, Anfinson won a Nobel Prize for showing that uh, proteins can refold spontaneously to their native conformation after they've been denatured. And what that shows is that all the information necessary to encode the conformation is there in the amino acid sequence. And the Anfinson thermodynamic of hypothesis was that the protein adopts the minimum free energy conformer of all available conformers, and it does it spontaneously. It, you, there doesn't have to be anything providing energy to do it. It does it spontaneously. And the underlying thought is that that must be due to the side chain interactions largely, because all backbones are the same, and therefore there can't be any real discrimination in the backbone. So here's Anfinson. Um, this is what he thought. I know this is what he thought because I asked him. Um, all backbones are the same. The side chains have to discriminate. And so suppose you had, let's say, uh, a population of proteins in a test tube. I don't know, 10 to the 15th proteins in a test tube, let's say. And now in under denaturing conditions, like say an eight molar urea, um, the, this population would, uh, the population of proteins, the proteins would all unfold. It might be that no two proteins have identical conformations, but when you dialyze away the urea, now the protein is under folding conditions and it folds up to essentially one overall conformation, the native conformation. How does it know to do that? And the thought is that this, these interactions between and among the atoms are, some of them are favorable, some of them are unfavorable, but the most favorable ones of the lot are the ones that correspond to the native conformation. That's what he thought. I mean, this is thermodynamics, that's what it does. Kind of doesn't matter what he thought. Um, it's really clear that as you dialyze away the denaturant, the protein folds to its native state. 
So if you try to summarize what this paradigm is, paradigm is misspelled, sorry. Um, it's sort of like this. The unfolded state is a featureless random coil and the folded state of which we have about 180,000 examples in the protein database at the moment is the minimum free energy conformer. It's large, the unfolded state is largely featureless. Since all backbones are the same, it's the side chains that discriminate and the organizing interactions are um, visible here in the native state. And therefore you can use that information to try to figure out what's going on when the protein folds. And what I want to emphasize in the rest of this talk is that this idea of attractive interactions being responsible for selecting the native state from all other possibilities. What's going on in this is that excluding forces have been largely neglected. And remember the Ramachandran plot is excluding forces and CPK models are excluding forces. So why have they been neglected? Um, it seems really clear, that, to me at least, that the idea of excluding forces was in the air at the time. So even prior to the Ramachandran plot, here's work of Wood and Jacobson and Alder and Wainwright. And in my book on molecular simulations by Frankel and Schmidt, here's a little quip, a little story. In the mid 1950s, one of the burning questions in StatMech was this, can crystals form in a system of spherical particles that have sh harsh short range repulsion, repulsive forces, but no mutual attraction whatsoever. And so these folks did a simulation and showed that in fact, such a system really does have a first order freezing transition, like protein folding, it's first order. And people at the meeting, um, famous people, most of them didn't believe it. Um, including a couple Nobel laureates, but the work of the last 30 years um, has shown that harsh repulsive forces really do determine the structural properties of a simple liquid. This isn't a protein, but a simple liquid, and that attractive forces are, a, in a sense, secondary importance. Now, at about the same time, Fred Richards um, at Yale was turning from experimental work to modeling. And here is a famous review by Richards in Annual Reviews of Biophysics and Bioengineering called Areas, Volumes, and Packing. He's very much interested in packing. And what he said is for chemically bonded atoms and the distribution isn't spherically symmetric and and the properties of the atoms aren't isotropic. Nevertheless, he says, as applied specifically to proteins, the work of Ramachandran and his colleagues has provided much of our present thinking about permissible peptide chain conformations. And this was 1977 and a review summing up a number of years of previous work. So again, um, it's excluding forces. Here's work by Giant Banavar and Amos Maraton. Um, for about 20 years, these are physicists, and for about 20 years, these physicists have been trying to model the building blocks of proteins, helices and sheet, from physics alone using purely geometric ideas. So, no chemistry in this, just geometry. And in fact, Last year, um, working with Tatiana Skirbik, who is a postdoc with, with Giant Manavar, they have been able to successfully model helix and sheet using simply geometric ideas. They derive them as building blocks. So how did they do that? The idea is that there's a quest for building blocks here. This is standard in science and mathematics. Um, the idea to find a small number of building blocks or axioms that can account for an entirety of data. So for example, um, 
a linear algebra, the vector space of a linear algebra, you find a basis set. Um, and from the basis set, you can generate all the vectors. Or um, the grammar of a language, a small number of rules that it can account for the entirety of the language. Universal Turing machines, the axioms of arithmetic, the piano axioms, five axioms that can account for the entirety of the positive integers. Euclidean geometry. Why do we study Euclidean geometry in high school, which we do here? We don't do it nearly so much in order to understand the theorems that are proved. Um, how often have you used the idea that the, uh, the if you have an isosceles triangle, let's say, that the angles opposite are equal to one another. Um, but that these very um, counterintuitive ideas can be proved from a very small set of axioms. <clears throat> and what Bonaver and Maritain did was to assume that they could take a generalization of a sphere, <clears throat> which in this case is a tube. Bonaver calls it a, a like a garden hose. And the idea is if you wrap this tube up in such a way as to have a maximum compactness, but without making it so compact that the tube intersects itself, and you do that just with geometry, what you do automatically is generate helices and beta strands. Now, what size would they be? Well, you need a scaling factor. And the one thing that they took from chemistry as a scaling factor, um, it's a bond length. And all the rest is just geometry. Curiously, um, this paper was hard to get published. Uh, they showed, again, just purely from geometry that those are the possible structures. It didn't show necessarily that they were stable structures. Who, know, who knew from geometry whether they'd be stable in the real world? That's chemistry. But the structures themselves, that's a, fundamental to protein evolution. And it's curious that they had a trouble publishing this paper. Um, people thought that they already knew everything about alpha helices. So who was interested in this? And I want to point out that in 1951, Pauling um, came up with the alpha helix and beta sheet from modeling. And if instead of publishing the Skirbik et al. paper in 2021, which they did, if it had been in 1950, it would have been considered unbelievable genius. Um, but of course, they wouldn't have done it. There wouldn't have been a motivation, nor would have been motivation to have the grammar of a language before there was a language, or the axioms of arithmetic before there was arithmetic. So attractive forces versus excluding, excluding forces, I think it's a mistake um, in, in the way we have looked at things for the past 50 years that we have not emphasized excluding forces to the degree that they deserve. Ramachandra plot, CPK models, harsh repulsive forces and modeling of simple liquids, close packing as Richards has done, um, Banaver and Maritain's work on geometry, and yet excluding forces haven't been the major focus in protein folding. And this all stems from the kind of thinking that's inherent in the Ramachandra plot. So why haven't excluded excluding forces um, been center stage in all this? And I think the reason why is this whole idea that you look at the final structure and you can figure out how it got there by looking at the interactions. The seeing is deceiving is what I say. It's not seeing as believing. You look at that, you think that that's telling you how it got there, and I claim, no, it's not. It's the excluding forces that did all the heavy lifting here. Um, so I've been working on this a long time. I published a couple papers about it last year. Let's talk a little bit more about excluding forces. There are basically two kinds, um, steric clash and um, 
disfavor and polar groups that don't have a hydrogen bond partner. So excluding forces, unlike driving forces, driving forces are in fact these attractive interactions. Excluding forces are these disfavored interactions. They exclude high energy interactions and therefore they reduce the entropy loss unfolding. And if there are a lot of them, then they reduce the entropy loss in a substantial way. So the two types I wanna talk about are sterics and hydrogen bond satisfaction. The Roman Chandran plot is strictly sterics. Um, conformers that have steric clashes or backbone polar groups that lack hydrogen bond partners make a negligible contribution to the overall thermodynamic population. And you won't find them in the native structure and therefore analyzing the native structure won't tell you what happened behind the curtain before the protein folded. So there's the Raman Chandran plot. And now using that, Cyrus Leventhal came up with basically a back of the envelope calculation, which is now known as the Leventhal paradox, but it wasn't a paradox at all. It was a back of the envelope demonstration that when proteins fold, that they don't fold by exhaustive search of, of conformers. Because if they did, the length of time, it would take even a chain of about 100 residues to do an exhaustive search um, would be um, even at 10 to the minus 13 seconds per bond rotation. It would still be more than um, a larger number than Avogadro's number of confirmations. And therefore to explore it, would take an egregious amount of time, more than the age of the universe, and certainly more than the age of you or me, and more than the length of time it takes for a typical protein to fold under folding conditions. Where did that come from? Where did Leventhal come up with that? Leventhal said, well, um, if there are, this is sort of a paraphrase, um, this isn't quite what Leventhal did, but suppose there were only two populations and the first residue could be in one of these two and the second residue could be one of these two. And so a chain that's a hundred residues long would have two to the hundredth possibilities. That's 10 to the 30th possible conformers. Uh, why did Leventhal assume that you could treat each of these conformers independently of all the others. And the answer to that is that it was a hypothesis of, of Flory, Flory's isolated pair hypothesis um, published in his book on statistical mechanics. And the hypothesis is that each Phi pair is sterically independent of all the others. And if that's so, then exactly what Leventhal did in modeling this makes perfect sense. However, we examine this. We means uh, Rohit Papu and Rajgopal Srinivasan. Um, Rohit is now uh, a named professor, an endowed professor at Washington University in St. Louis. Raj Srinivasan is the head of uh, biocomputing at Tata Consultancy um, here. And what they showed um, in several different ways is that this idea that, that steric restrictions have to be confined to nearest neighbors, which is the isolated pair hypothesis, that's wrong. And so Rohit Papu had a, a uh, more theoretical approach to it, but Nick Fitzke, who's now a professor at Missis Mississippi State, um, Nick's ha Nick had a simpler idea, and what he did was to show that just by sterics alone, that if you had had an alpha helix, and then you took the next residue after the alpha helix and put it in a beta strand, that it would lead to a steric clash. And the steric clash was between the ith residue and the ith minus two residue, um, in the alpha helix. And the steric clash is not a nearest neighbor clash, and therefore it falsifies 
the Flory isolated pair hypothesis. An alpha helix can't be followed by a continuous beta strand. And it's a backbone backbone class. It's a carbonyl oxygen with a carbonyl oxygen. So it doesn't make any difference what the side chains are. It's a backbone backbone clash. If you put the backbones in alpha helix and follow it immediately by something that's in beta, you get that clash. And initially what you think when you look at this is, well, you could just relax the phi psi angles a little bit and get rid of the clash, but you can't. And that's why this is a, a paper, not just a picture. And here's a comment on it by Buzz Baldwin and Bruno Zim when it came out. So, um, steric clash is, violates the Flory isolated pair hypothesis. It's really important because it means that if you had an alpha helix and then tried to have a beta strand immediately afterwards, starting at a beta sheet, you'd get this steric clash, you can't do it. So you can't introduce this in the middle of a helix and have some kind of chimeric uh, structure, it won't work. So this rarefies the structures that you'll find. And in order to have a beta strand after an alpha helix, you really need some kind of uh, loop or turn in the middle. And of course, if you looked a lot of protein structure, you recognize intuitively you already knew that because you don't find beta strands starting immediately after alpha helix. And this is why. Well, the other excluding interaction is hydrogen bond satisfaction. It's the 21st century. We still don't know how much a hydrogen bond is worth. We know how much it's worth enthalpically. We can measure that. But what's the free energy of a hydrogen bond? And I'm talking about a hydrogen bond within a protein. So the emphasis on hydrogen bonding has been largely, if you make a hydrogen, if the polypeptide makes a hydrogen bond with water when it's unfolded, but it becomes a peptide hydrogen bond when the protein folds. Is that peptide hydrogen bond favored over the hydrogen bond with water or disfavored? And there's an argument about it. Some think, some people think that it's favored by about a kcal. Some people think it's disfavored by about a kcal. What this misses is the fact that if, when the protein is unfolded, the backbone polar groups could make hydrogen bonds with water. But when the protein is folded, some of the backbone is on the inside. If they didn't have hydrogen bond partners, that's not plus or minus one kcal. That's an unsatisfied polar group. That we know from quantum mechanics is worth about five kcals. Five kcals is approximately the whole free energy difference between a folded and an unfolded protein. So you can't have very many of those and have the protein survive. In fact, if you Boltzmann weight this, um, the um, likelihood of having one is about 0.02%. So hydrogen bonds, we presume, are a major organizer of conformation, and all proteins are built on hydrogen bond scaffolds of alpha helix and beta sheet, and for thermodynamic reasons, they must be. Why is that? Because if you had even one unsatisfied backbone polar group, it would cost it come at a cost of about five kcals, rivaling the whole free energy difference between the folded and unfolded state, and driving the equilibrium between unfolded and folded back towards the unfolded state. So I'll say it again. When a protein folds, many backbone polar groups are removed from solvent access. Why? because they have hydrophobic side chains, and so they cluster together to form a core, and the backbone is sequestered from solvent. So those groups have to find intramolecular hydrogen bond partners, because if they didn't find intramolecular hydrogen bond partners, it would be so disfavored. One unsatisfied group would drive the equilibrium back towards the unfolded state, because the whole free energy difference between the unfolded state and the folded state typically for proteins is in the range minus five to minus 15 kcals per mole. And what we know from Ramachandran's work is there, there are only two extensible, extensible 
hydrogen bond satisfying conformers that don't immediately get you in trouble with steric clash, alpha helices and beta strands. And so for thermodynamic reasons, all proteins have to be built on scaffolds of these hydrogen bonded elements. And when you look at proteins in the PDB, of which there are almost 200,000 these days, they are all built on scaffolds of alpha helix and beta sheet, with the exception of the very small um, metal binding peptides. They're kind of overgrown peptides and they bind metals and they can evade this, but essentially all the regular uh, globular proteins are built on these scaffolds and it's thermo of thermodynamic necessity. They have to satisfy their hydrogen bonds and that's the only way they can do it. Otherwise they got into trouble. So how many different scaffolds can there be for a protein? Uh, let's say a protein domain. I don't know how big a protein domain is. Let's say a lysozyme is a single domain protein. Lysozyme has 129 residues. So um, if you look at it, it has about 10 elements of either alpha helix or beta sheet. So if you took that as a model, uh, 10 scaffold elements, how many different scaffolds could you have? Well, the first one could be alpha or beta. The second one could be alpha or beta, two to the 10th, um, two to the 10th, 1,024 possibilities times whatever complexity there is when you wire them up. But when you wire them up, the loops between them are very short. Here's a histogram of the loop lengths for um, 2,700 proteins. And the loop lengths are typically very short. Right here, they peak right around where a peptide chain turn is. And because they're short, they're very constraining. And so one can conclude that just for the backbone alone, to satisfy that, there can only be a few thousand scaffolds possible for something the size of lysosome. And so this idea that the side chains are the, what's selecting from this Avogadro's number of possibilities, no, to satisfy the backbone, you immediately winnow down to just a few thousand possibilities. Uh, Cyrus Chothia, saw this before we did. Uh, so for a protein domain, only a few thousand backbone scaffolds are possible, maybe 10,000 at most, not some compre incomprehensibly large number. Now, the side chains do have a role. The side chains discriminate among this uh, set of conceivable scaffolds they select but they have to select from a few thousand, not from something larger than Avogadro's number. And even here, steric excluding, inter steric excluding interactions impose lots of further in, uh, restrictions. Side chains discriminate amongst these alternatives. Is it long range interactions between and among the side chains? So here is um, my attempt to develop a Ramachandran map for side chains, not for backbone. And the idea here is that you take the Ramachandran dipeptide, a, a blocked monopeptide basically, NC-alpha CO, and it has a, a uh, an acetyl group on one side and an amide group on, on blocking on the other side. And you can drive that through all possible conformations. And the, you drive the backbone through all possible conformations. You pick up the clash-free ones. That's the Ramachandran plot. And for each, you're doing this in a kind of fine-grained manner. And for each backbone conformation for the dipeptide, you generate for each possible side chain, all of the allowed conformers for that side chain. Eliminate all those that have clash and count the ones that don't. And so for each allowed side chain conformation corresponding to a, an allowed backbone conformation, you increment the count 
and then you look at the weights. And here's an example for leucine, but this is done for all 18 side chains. Glycine, of course, doesn't have a side chain, and proline doesn't either. So here's leucine um, here from um, six, well, 6,000 leucine backbones from a large uh, data set of proteins. And you plot what the phi psi angles are for the backbone of these leucines, and it's a Raman Chandran plot. Uh, and most of it is here in the alpha region. If you now just do this in a kind of coarse grained way, and you do it um, not extracting these angles from proteins, but instead um, just generate them, what you find is something that looks rather like a Raman Chandran plot. There are some differences. This is the most populated region in proteins. This is the most populated region is there. Um, a little bit different. But of course, in proteins, the, the hydrogen bonds are counted. And here we're just doing sterics. Now, if you take every single one of these allowed phi psi angles, and for that phi psi angle, you generate all the different leucine side chains that you can with that particular backbone, and you plot it, you get something that looks like this. If you looked at where the leucine side chains were in this database of proteins that have been solved by crystallography, here are 6,000 leucine side chains, and you get something that looks like this. So the leucine side chain, um, the primary population is there, and mostly it's empty space, just like the Ramachandran plot for the backbone. If you do this for the side chain in the way I just said, what you see is that it's not identical. Um, this is disallowed, typically disallowed in proteins. It's not disallowed here. But the major population is right up here. And this is just for a blocked single residue. So the information that is you thought might be encoded in the long range interactions in proteins, that information is already there guiding what's going on in a blocked monopeptide, not just for leucine, but in the paper we've done all 18 side chains, and they're all like this. And it is remarkable that most of this phi size space, well, it's not phi size space anymore, it's chi one, chi two space, and most of the chi one, chi two space is disallowed. And of course, we find that it is exactly disallowed, just for a blocked monopeptide. So that's a Ramachandran plot for side chains. And it's the same idea, and it seems to work in roughly the same way, and it is very local. So I want to conclude by asking a question that people have asked me for years. Did GNR deserve a Nobel Prize? In my and here he is um, with Linus Pauling and Dorothy Hodgkin and Moodliar, and, and there's Ramachandran. And my answer to that, based on the influence that this two dimensional plot of just a dipeptide has had in influencing the whole development of protein folding for the next 50 years. My answer to that is, yeah, he really did deserve a Nobel Prize, although it might have taken a little while for uh, people to realize it. And of course, he was nominated for one. He didn't get it. Uh, so my answer is, yes, of course. Thank you for inviting me to share these thoughts with you. And I'm going to conclude here. Thank you so much, Professor Rose, for uh sharing with us both your personal interactions with Professor Ramachandran that he made you complete your homework and also the thinking that has gone behind it. It's really very enlightening to see the thinking that has gone behind uh, trying to answer the question of why or how do proteins fold based on both the side chain interactions, the backbone interactions, the importance of the exclusion forces as of course the attractive 
So we are really thankful to you both for your uh, presentation as well as the time, because it's quite late mm -hmm. in Baltimore, I understand, so. Well, my great privilege to do this, and I want you to know that I intend to stay here because I, I really want to hear all the other speakers. So I'll be here. That, that's very nice to know. That's very nice to know. And uh, given any opportunity, we would really like to invite you to our institute. And I hope that you will accept our invitation to visit our institute. I would love to do it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So our uh, second speaker this morning is Professor Tejpal Singh. Professor Singh is currently a sub distinguished professor at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. He has made significant contributions in the fields of extra crystallography, structural biology, peptide design, and drug discovery. His current focus is on the structural and functional studies of innate immunity proteins and their applications against microbial infections. He has published more than 450 research articles and has submitted more than 620 protein structures in the protein data bank. Professor Singh is a fellow of the World Academy of Sciences, the Indian National Science Academy, the Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Sciences, and the Biotech Research Society of India. He has received Professor G. N. Ramachandran Award of the Kerala State Council of Science, Technology, and Environment. Professor G.N. Ramachandran CSIR Gold Medal for Excellence in Biological Sciences and Technology. Professor G.N. Ramachandran 60th Birthday Commemoration INSA Medal. Uh, Sastra G.N. Ramachandran Award for Excellence in Science. And Professor G.N. Ramachandran Lecture Award of the Society of Biological Chemists of India. So practically all the G.N. Ramachandran Awards within the country. In addition to this, he is also the recipient of several other prestigious national and international awards. Listing them here will consume time, which I think will be better spent listening to him. So I invite uh, Professor Singh to deliver his presentation, please. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Professor Singh. It's very good to see you. This is Dulal. Professor Dulal. I think something wonderful you have done by organizing this meeting. I'm so delighted and Chita for helping you in this. I'm really very happy to be part of this. Thank you so much. And I think we should remember Jin Ramachandran definitely more and more. It's very inspiring to know about him. You all are using his contributions from a day-to-day -day scientific research. It's extraordinary. I just put on my slides and then I'll talk more about Can you see my slides? Hello? Not yet. Not yet? Okay. A little. My slides.
So we can see the slides. Uh, it can be turned on the full screen mode. Okay, okay. You can see? Yes, we can see these slides. If if you can make it full screen. Okay, okay. Sorry, sir. You see now? No, Don't. sir. I share a view. Can you see now? If so? Yeah, we can see this slide, sir. If they can be made into full screen, then I think it should be okay. Control F. What do I do now? You can see. F5. I, I just F5. F5. Slide mode. Yeah, slide mode. Good. You see now? Yes, yes, yes. You can see and hear also. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Uh, I come back to my appreciation for Professor Bilal Panda. I think it's a wonderful thing that he has done by organizing this this, uh, this meeting on Professor G. N. Ramachandran and how we have been appreciating him. And I think you heard of a fantastic account from Professor Rose about his scientific contributions and his journey into such. Great. I will change the gear a little bit because. I'm more of a user of his outstanding contributions. But before that, I will just present some of the slides. So this slide was made by Dr. Mashilka in more than 15 years before. And if you see from this, first four, these are all contributions in physics and mathematics, the individual excellence. And GNRs was the last, the most important contribution. I think up to 1950s, extraordinary work. And this being centenary year, this is very appropriate to talk about and to remember him and to appreciate and to say how much we have been using his contributions. So I have a couple of slides to appreciate and to say how great things have happened in Medras when he was there. See, it's very remarkable if you notice here, the period he, has, he spent in Medros was just 17 years, 52, 1950 to 1969. And such outstanding contributions, such big volume of work came out in those 17 years, exceptional contribution. And I think we should remember this, that when we talk about scientific, Contribution many factors matter. I even you are you heard about all these things. So I will skip this slide. But this slide I come back again. It was shown by Dr. Rose. See his being there in Madras and Dr. Mudaliar being there. It's a kind of the whole ecosystem was so strong that mind was so fertile because of all these things. You know, many times we talk about places and mentoring and all those things, they matter a lot. So mentoring of Dr. Mudaliar and the place of Madras contributed to his thinking. And that's very important, we should realize. There was one, uh, one incident I should tell you that many years before, delegation was visiting India. Prime Minister Narsi Mara was the delegation that how to make great science. He said that appoint mentors don't appoint administrative directors or vice chancellors. So Professor Dulal Panda, you are a mentor. It's a wonderful thing that you have joined NIPA. And I think mentoring is a very important factor. So in the case of Ramachandran, this was very clear. In fact, in many instances, when people had this kind of mentoring, great scientific research happened. But I would say that Kevin Disney was like that. WL, Max mentoring was exceptional. So we should keep in mind that mentoring is one of the very important factors. 
Now, as you heard about this, also that we have now large number of structures, all of them are validated by GNR spy side map. So you can see the impact of these contributions is just enormous. Be like anybody else, uh, these are side just to show his back from science. So, like anybody else, I would also say that my first meeting I, I entered IIS in 1971. I think he also entered the same year in the beginning. I, I, I entered in the month of August, and he joined some. So, uh, earlier in the Institute of Science Bangalore, in 1971, they used to organize. Welcome, welcome party for PhD students. All those things are gone now. So when the party was organized, I was one of the late comers. I sat on the table, which was very close to the entrance, and he came even later. So he sat on the same table, and that was the interaction. That was, this is what I remember. How exciting it was to us. I was talking like a like a colleague in very excited way about many things. So I remember those things. Of course, Professor Anju Bansal has worked with him for many years. But I heard his talks many times. I think it was a mesmerizing and it was outstanding. And all the time when I knew and new structures of proteins, every time I feel that how extraordinary contribution he is. A whole lot of validations dependent on the concept the map provided to all of us. So it is an exceptional contribution to scientific research. But I hear those said this is very, I won't call it unfair, but this is very wrong that he didn't receive a Nobel Prize. But I think at the same time, I would say that many times Nobel Prizes have negative impact. He didn't receive a Nobel Prize, but because of criticism of his college and structure, which eventually turned out to be Correct structure gives so many more things. It was so critical development of science, particularly protein science, protein structures, and understanding conformations. All the time when I get the protein structures, I appreciate how how extraordinary work it did so fastly in those years. I try to look at protein chains, protein turning back, all these beta turns and everything. It's a great, great uh, contribution. Always remember this. But one more thing that uh, it's a funny thing that many countries like ours they appreciate tax more than actual scientific contributions. In my opinion, Ramachandra has been the greatest scientist in India. I think, as happens in many countries, we should have a lot more visibility of his personality in the country. I think only we in scientific community keep appreciating. General public have to think about this. I will just now talk about a few things that we have been doing in recent times. So when you talk about microbial infections, how do you counter them? There are four basic ways that first of first of the or First of them is innate immunity. Normally, when you are infected and pathogen sent to your body, your innate immune system gets activated. And in principle, theoretically, you should be able to fight them. It doesn't happen because of many factors. Many factors because you are not maintaining an ideal body, an ideal situation. So, but this is the first and most important thing. And, and of course, and you know how antibodies and vaccines and all those things happen subsequently. It's a passive is to counter this. Because we were very lucky when many decades ago antibiotics were incidentally discovered, turned out to be very potent antimicrobial agents. And because uh, they appeared on the scene, synthetic drugs we didn't make many. And that has led, but the recent corona pandemic has revealed that antibiotics are not effective, can't make vaccines quickly. The innate immune system is not doing what it should do. 
he had realized that making drugs and developing drugs all the time is very important. Today, I will talk something about what, how we can exploit our innate immune system, how we can use it, and that passage is very significant. He thought that innate immune system is something, it's a germline, and we do not worry about this. But it has a lot of information if you understand this. But if you understand this structurally, it tells you how you can exploit this and how you can make use of this to protect you from infections. So that is okay. So I think many, many years before when we started doing structures of proteins, we wanted to look at large number of proteins. Of course, now more and more we are focusing on certain systems. So I will talk about innate immune system, one of the members of the innate immune system, which is mammalian heme peroxidase. It's a very small window of contributions. So you see what you saw from current pandemic that virus became very crazy and it was a devastating thing, this pandemic. What, how does virus enter your, body, your system? And three main ways are the mouth, nose, and eyes. So this is, the, this is where the virus enters. What, what happens here? What is the situation at the entry site? There are certain protein molecules which are secreted there. which try to uh, fight the virus. They are able to fight to an extent, but they are not able to prevent. What are the lacunas? Why they are not able to fight fully and prevent us from infections? So there, these four members, these four proteins, although the names look very old, but they are the critical ones. They are the ones which, which are expressed at the sites where pathogen is entering and you see lysozyme is very old and other people have worked. We have done little work on lysozyme so structures. But rest of the three molecules we have extensively worked. I think some of them only we have worked in these areas. We realized during this pandemic how important these molecules could be. I think we it was not thought much about them. You see that how significant they are to fight infections, infections of the kind which happened during this current pandemic. You see the first, when you look at these proteins, different animals, natural system, that you see their expressions. Somewhere some proteins are expressed, somewhere some other, they all contribute to the, the innate action these pathogens. So this should have a message that in camel and porcine two animals, one protein is expressed in very high quantity, and other proteins are not really expressed. It's like system is investing in one protein and improving it a lot to fight infections. And other animals are expressing other proteins, not as expressing this one significantly. So it would mean that they are trying to use more weapons, but perhaps their potencies are average. But this one, these two animals, use, express this protein in high quantity, very enhanced potency, just like a nuclear bomb here and normal emissions here. So this gives a message that excessive expression of a particular protein and other proteins not being there is sort of uh, economizing your resources. And when we looked at the structure of this protein, this animal it has a very different structure. That's how it protects these two animals much more than other animals are protected by these proteins. So, examining the structures and learning how these proteins are better, I think the better ones can be used as therapeutic molecules those cases where this protein is either in low concentration or not as potent as this one. So this is first time that uh, say that innate immune is not just there as a germline, it 
can be exploited as a therapy for therapeutic applications. So you see how, what these papers do. First, for the peptidoglycan recognition proteins, there are four members in this, as clear from the name, bind to bacterial or microbial cell wall molecules and using some mechanisms for them. Not talk of these details. And lactoferrin sequesters are in very exceptional high efficiency. That's how it does, and how lysozyme, as we all know, that has And mammalian heme peroxidases, there are four, four members in this, and they act as enzymes. They use hydrogen peroxide to convert, produce an intermediate, and that, that intermediate uses a substrate, antimicrobial. That's how it works. So we'll talk about the last one, and that is what. It's very relevant to talk about infections. See, when you talk about heme peroxide, there are four, four members in this. The current one you see it's expressed excessively in mucous saliva, but I learned where the uh, virus has been entering. This is more relevant in the present context. They do this in different situations. So we'll focus on this. So I, I again and again keep on reminding you that this protein is expressed excessively the sites, the sites where virus enters. So biochemically we understood this mechanism, how this works. First, hydrogen peroxide tracks with this, produces an intermediate, and then that intermediate, enzyme intermediate, tracks with substrate, the real substrate, thiocyanate, is hypothiocyanide, which is highly, highly antimicrobial. So this, we had idea biochemically how this mechanism occurs after determining large number of structures. Now we have established the mechanism, structure, and it has give, given many ideas why this is important to know structurally so that applications could be. So you look at this mechanism. Glucose oxidase is also expressed highly in those sites where infections occur. And this converts, goes into something else, and hydrogen peroxide, which is required for many, many things, required for this particular reaction. And generally, production of hydrogen peroxide is more than required. So that's why some enzymes are made even to control this particular. Neutralize or to convert hydrogen peroxide into water. So there's no, this particular molecule is in abundance there, the site where infection is occurring. And as I said, that enzyme is expressed in high concentration proportional to the intensity of infections. So we have no problem of this particular molecule, which is a substrate number one, and the enzyme, which is expressed in excess. So these, this reaction will always occur, always taking place where the infections are being. The issue has been that the second substrate, you know, control on the second substrate, and this natural substrate, thiocyanate, is very, very, not a very good molecule to administer externally. So this substrate is an issue, and many times, the uh, limitation of this particular reaction is the availability of this particular substrate. And that is why uh, the enzyme is there, the substrate number one is there, because of lack of this substrate, will not be producing enough quantity of enough quantity of antimicrobial product oxidized products. So that is an issue. How do we handle tackle this issue? You we'll see in this but schematically, what is going on is you have no problem of H2O2, as I said, produced in abundance. Enzyme is produced in abundance. And this thiocyanate reaction, the, this particular enzyme converts thiocyanate into this, but there's a, there's a problem of this substrate's concentration. So what is intended here, search, design, take new substrates, which could be 
turned as therapeutic agent this enzyme being there will convert them back to that's how it exploit the innate immune system the molecules the innate immune system by supplying these substrates so how how do you get to know these substrates see structures from large number of species, animal species primarily, understand that as nature done some engineering on this, different animals being in different habitats <clears throat> tend to modify their proteins, tend to modify fight pathogens. So we do the structures of these proteins from a number of species to understand how these proteins are their, their sequencing structures and trends. But if you see in the later part of this, this is particularly after the pandemic occurred, we started focusing on how can we also participate in the process of fighting this pandemic through some kind of contribution. See, when this is, because this audience is very general kind, when you determine a structure of a protein, the first look of a protein molecule See, it looks some kind of very complicated. You cannot make out anything after this. For a man not doing structures, if you're not looking at structures, it should look like a funny looking architecture. But if you understand, you can make it better and better. And I'll just make you slightly better for you to understand this. So you do some little bit of draw uh, in a different way. You see, when you write in a way, you now it starts in some kind of cleft here. This cleft is the one the substrates find. It starts seeing the shape of the cleft. It starts seeing the chemistry of the cleft. And if you know the chemistry and shape, you can design molecules to see it more clearly and magnify it, zoom it further. And even more schematically, substrate is very deep inside the hinge what is sitting in the very deep inside, so there is a kind of, you can see some kind of hydrophobic channel. Normal native case is filled with water molecules, but the substrate has to enter through this. And this site where W1 is coordinated, coordinated to heme iron, hydrogen bonded to this histidine residue, is the site where hydrogen peroxide binds. Hydrogen, hydrogen peroxide is added to this replaces W1. Once hydrogen peroxide comes here, the action occurs, the help of, of course, the government there, and you get an intermediate. And once this intermediate is ready, the substrate normally should bind at the site of where your W1 is. And then the next step happens. So this is how, this is important to understand. Uh, also one more point is important here. <clears throat> See, when we talk about blocking the binding site of enzymes, design inhibitors, so what you require, the interactions between the enzyme and the ligand, and if these interactions are good enough, and the enzyme sits anywhere in the substrate binding cell, blocks the site, the result function of the enzyme is inhibited. When you talk about substrate, we're here, we're interested to design substrates. So if you talk about substrate, just doesn't have to bind here, just to bind appropriately, brilliant appropriately, so, so as to produce the product. And that's much more critical. It requires much more precise knowledge about the binding site and about what kind of molecules are ion can be put here, which will act as substrate. Anything can act as inhibitor, it binds here. The substrate has to orient with regard to these amino acids and the uh, converted intermediate in So it's a very a tricky and critical thing, but it's very important, particularly uh, the real exploitation of the innate immune system. If we can use substrates, this kind of molecules, which are so important to fight infections. You see, this is again just to give ideas to general audience. 
Now, coming back to this equation again, see, earlier we used to wonder about how to trap enzyme substrate intermediates, but this system has two substrates, so you can trap both intermediates, because until you have the next substrate, the other intermediate will remain. So if you interact, you make H2O2 to interact with this enzyme, you will get this, and this will not convert it into native protein until this substrate comes in. So you can study this in detail. And if you don't give H2O2 and give your substrate alone, you will make a complex with substrate. So this is how earlier times we will all the time try low temperature things and worried about. So here you see the mechanism how uh, these substrates interact and how they form intermediates. So really understanding the enzyme substrate mechanism at a structural molecule level very precisely. Now in this protein, the real site where reaction occurs, we have a heme moiety here and critical amino acids, arginine and histidine is water molecule W1. So the first and foremost thing is that understand how hydrogen peroxide binds to this. How when there is nothing there, what is lying here, and how substrate SCN binds, where it is located. Get an idea if you have to design a molecule, natural substrate actually binds. And if the product is not consumed, how the product binds and inhibits this. This is the first few steps one has to do structurally and understand the whole process of mode of action. So first we of course did the native protein. When you say native protein, you have nothing. So you observe water molecules. So on the left side, of course, this is experimental observation. You see electron density, and you see water molecules occupy the site, which we call substrate binding site, or too precisely, distal heme cavity. Heme is here, this is a distal site, this is a proximal site. So you understand how water molecules are filling this space. Then if you Add H2O2, the substrate, how does it bind? See, H2O2 replaces water molecule, W1, and it is oriented, and you can understand how it is interacted with heme, iron, and histidine. And then by examining intermediate, you also understand how it's getting converted into intermediate. So this is how what you observe structurally, but trying to gain knowledge before you actually come to design substrates. For applications. Then, of course, since we knew that thiocyanate works in a substrate reaction, structure of thiocyanate. Thiocyanate doesn't replace water molecules. It ought not to. This is a site for hydrogen peroxide. If any molecule goes and replaces water molecule W1, it becomes an inhibitor. The substrate has to be held at the site before it reaches W1. So it's a very critical situation. So, and you see SCN, the natural substrate, actually is held at the right site so that converted by this enzyme into a product and W1 is by Now, if you produce the products and they are not consumed, they will have tendency to bind and block the binding site. So we did the hypothyroid which replaces water. And then it inhibits. So when the enzyme is not required to perform action because product is not consumed, this action is not required to be inhibited. This is how. So you understand how the how product inhibition is taking place, how the substrate was binding, how hydrogen peroxide, the substrate number one, was binding, and how the water molecules were held. So you now have a fair idea as to how these. Uh, Compounds bind or these ions or anions bind to this enzyme at the substrate binding site. Now, this this was the knowledge we were publishing these papers earlier. And then there was a question, and for a while we didn't bother about we didn't worry about this. But then we a lot of things were going on. I think desperate things going on, and the pandemic was so devastating. So we had some. Some reports, lots of people were giving lots of ideas, lots of strange theories, non scientific theories, and so on. One we observed was this that 
how Japanese were infected less in crowded country, more crowded than many Western countries. But they had less infections in many countries like US, European nations. Costed much more. Yeah, so the one thing somebody reported, all kinds of things were reported, but this was one of the things. The iodized concentration in the populations of these countries. You see, US was a dismal situation. Japanese had a very good situation, 500 years, although the commander limit is higher than this. They, their iodide content in their body was much higher. This was somewhere in between. You can see from the epidemiological data that it's far, far more devastated than countries like Japan. So the question was to rose in that could iodide be a, playing some role in protecting? As far as we were concerned, for us, could iodide be playing a role by being part of this uh, peroxidase para system and getting converted into antimicrobial product? So it was necessary to examine. Decided to uh, structure with iodide, exposed <coughs> the crystals to iodide, <coughs> crystallized, of course, ammonium iodide to see. Iodide goes and binds to this protein, binds to the right site, binding site, and whether it is converted into a product. So these were important questions. A clue came from this that iodide could be interesting. You see, now coming back to this reaction again, so we thought that first two steps are taking place. Is this step is also taking place? Is iodide being converted into hypoiodide? Now, biochemically or chemically is one way to see that. It's one can see by but structurally prove that the iodide is produced. It's very, very important. Really understand the real mode of binding of iodide. Because know that bromide and chloride bind to this enzyme, but they are not converted into products. So we, I, I think even the size of nine matters. The substrate positioning is very important for the, for the enzyme to act. So this is a very, very interesting thing. So we did a structure with iodine. You can see that iodide binds to the substrate binding site, doesn't replace water molecule W1, which is a site meant for hydrogen peroxide. Binds here, the substrate should be binding. So this proves that iodide binds to this protein without replacing water molecule W1. So it binds like a substrate. Now the critical question arises: <clears throat> substrate iodide is a very heavy atom. You can very nicely observe in the electron density. How do we observe the product iodide? See whether you have a reaction. Uh, if you mix uh, <clears throat> hydrogen peroxide with the enzyme, it is converted into intermediate. But if you give the substrate before before the hydrogen peroxide, then the reaction doesn't proceed because hydrogen peroxide may bind to this, but it doesn't achieve the orientation. It should achieve the freedom, and the substrate is absent. So we made a reaction in such a way that first, uh, in this case, first added hydrogen peroxide, allowed this enzyme to incubate with the enzyme, so it forms an intermediate, and then added substrate iodide, so that it would be already intermediate is formed, will be converted into substrate, and it is converted, sorry, product, it is converted into product, and if product is not consumed, it should go and bind to the enzyme and the substrate binding sites. So we did we structure like this. And if you see the next slide, you observe some kind of this is for the uh, structural biology community. You observe electron densities in the difference for your map. So to begin with, we decided to put iodide atoms because in a crystallographic terms, iodide is a very heavy atom. 
oxygen is very small atom. It's very difficult to observe oxygen atom. We have iodide. So we initially put iodide, iodide ion here at these sites. Then when you calculate, you see the residual densities at every position of iodide. Means that there's something more than iodide here. So then we put the hypoiodide and then we find, so like putting hypoiodide instead of iodide and we find, it finds very nice that there's no residual density. So it's, it's a real structural evidence that iodide is converted into hypoiodide. And there's the first structural evidence that observe iodide in the form of hypoiodide when you prepare the reaction carefully. Slice this and do the structure. So this proves that hypoiodide is converted into hypo. Sorry, iodide is converted into hypoiodide by, by this enzyme. Therefore, if iodide is administered, there is iodide available there at the site of infections where enzyme is already there in high concentrations. As to O2 is there, it will produce antimicrobial hypoiodide product. Then and it can protect you from infections. So this is a very important thing. See, all these things we do, we must not forget that our structural biology cannot move without Ramachandran's Paisai man, without understanding how protein turns and all those things. That is anyway. So then I wanted to say so you see it here very clearly, hypoidite we observe. Then you wanted to examine other other sort of Compounds. We have this. We had this information that nitric nitric oxide is used in emergency pediatric situations for more than one reasons. But one could be something to protect from infections. And we did with nitric oxide. We also observed that nitric oxide is converted into nitrite, which is an oxidized product. Also, antimicrobial. So you see, in the iodide works as a substrate, nitric oxide works as a substrate. Then we wanted to examine some of the compounds because, as theory, it is good to have some kind of specific organic compounds. We tried some available compounds, small ones, after having realized the shape and chemistry of the binding site. First, emitron. Not found that structurally it really replaces water molecule, it works most, more like a like an inhibitor and not like a substrate. The small molecule we thought it will be placed appropriately track, but it is not a substrate. It is replacing water molecule W1 and not placed where it should be placed, converted into product. We tried another molecule much like found the same way. Orientation, but just water molecules blocking these two binding sites. So it is not held at the sub appropriate site where substrate should be held. So this also works more like a substrate. And we try down the compound, same situation. So you're wondering that how come these small molecules we thought should place in there? It is precisely, I'm not going to the details. The interactions provided by the side chains in the binding site very critically determine the orientation of these substrates, these compounds in the site. So those interactions are not helping these compounds. We tried another molecule, found that it really binds to the right substrate binding site appropriately. Therefore, in this case, if your reaction scheme has S2O2 added first to this enzyme, and then this substrate goes into generated product, and any product generated like this is an antimicrobial. So this compound could be interesting compound administered as therapeutic agent control this kind of viral infections. So this is how structurally you there's so much uh, knowledge about the stereochemistry of this, but some kind of Experimental evidence is necessary to prove these compounds work as substrates or inhibitors. Then we examined also 
this isoniazid, which is part of this anti-tuberculosis web cocktail. So it also binds like the way this compound bound, bound like a substrate. So therefore, then we found out that or we sort some data and information. How, how is the rate of infection in those cases for under anti-tuberculosis treatment, treatment for tuberculosis? Not very definite data, but there are clear indications that many of them were not infected so much. Also, generally, comorbidity conditions more lethal, but that was not the case with TB patients. So it could be that this particular enzyme was contributing to their protection. So this binds very nicely, very important, like a substrate. And if it's given to administer, produce required anti microbial effects. We also uh, examined were reports that women were infected less by viral infections. So what is different in women? And also there was a report that young women were protected more. So we examined this estrogen hormone, found that this also binds very well, sits well in the binding site at appropriate position with respect to the residues in the binding site and the water molecule site of hydrogen site. So this shows that knowledge of stereochemistry and with this kind of experiments can arrive at right kind of molecule in a quick time and can be then administer administer in these conditions where we have vaccines are taking time and other things are not there. In fact, drugs are definitely better than vaccine. You can't just be vaccinated. Necessarily, if you have molecules which can control and protect, it's a better option. So, with this, we find that by this approach, you can determine this kind of things. Yeah, I'm very conscious of time, but now what we have, we have iodide, we have nitric oxide, we have INH, we have this compound and estrogen, which have been proved to be very good substrates for this enzyme. And this enzyme converts them into product. That's how the product acts. So this is how innate immune system, a member of the innate immune system, can be exploited. It is like non-antibody response, a very powerful response. So this shows that innate immune system is not just there. This can be invoked and this can be exploited. If we have the knowledge and what we can do with this. So now in this final scheme of things, to supplement for the SCN, we have now more candidates so we fill this space. This enzyme being there, H202 being there. We have no problem of the antimicrobial products and safe and effective pathogens. So this is something. This kind of approach can make very useful contributions. So I essentially want to say that the innate immune system just cannot be left as a germline step that we cannot do anything. It is very important that it should be exploited in addition to getting the antibodies and vaccines and antibiotics and other drug discoveries targeting targets in the Messages. So this message I want to give you. And I thank um, Professor Dulal Panda and my dear student Roy for organizing this and asking me to speak. More than asking me to speak, I appreciate greatly the thought of Professor G. N. Ramachandran to organize a conference of this. And as I, as we all saw that previous presentation gave a wonderful history about his journey. It was very remarkable and very inspiring to all of us. Thank you very much. Uh, once upon a time, my group used to do this, now this, and I do now is much further slow. So things change, but thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. The presentation, I think, has served two uh, twofold purpose. One is the amount of work that you have done uh, to show how an enzyme of the innate immunity, protein of innate immunity, can be exploited, how the structural information about the protein can be exploited to design molecules. More than that, I think it will also help the students to appreciate how much of work, how much of effort goes into putting a single figure in a biochemistry textbook of enzyme inhibitor complexes or enzyme substrate complexes. So I'm extremely thankful to you for uh, highlighting that. And I think uh, the, uh, the, uh, it was probably an omen that uh, both you and Professor Ramachandran entered IISC in the same year, although same at uh, same year, but different levels. So right. it was probably Good three or two ends. ends of the. Yeah. <laughs> so it was probably preordained for you that you would work on protein structures. So it was pre decided. Uh, your, right, uh, but uh, once again, I want to thank both of you, Professor Dulal Panda. And I think I wanted to emphasize the significance of mentoring. He is now in a mentoring position. And he should transform NIPA. And like him there, things will change greatly. So I wish you all the best. Wish all the best to him. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. So our uh, third speaker of this morning session is Professor B. Jairam. Currently, Professor Jairam is the MHS Professor at the Department of Chemistry and Kusuma School of Biological Sciences at IIT Delhi. Uh, Professor Jairam's research interests include biomolecular modeling and simulation in relation to genome analysis, protein structure prediction, and uh, drug design. He completed his PhD in developing methodologies to model nucleic acid constituents at the City University of New York. Subsequently, he worked at Columbia University, where his work on electrostatics of DNA contributed to the development of Delphi software, which is now a part of the discovery studio used to carry out simulation studies of small molecules as well as biomolecules. He joined the chemistry department at IIT Delhi in 1990. His efforts have led to the establishment of the supercomputing facility for bioinformatics and computational biology at IIT Delhi, of which he is the founder coordinator. The facility has several freely available hardware and software accessed by over 20,000 users per day from over 30 different countries. We also associate Professor Jairam's name with the development of Chem Genome for genome annotation, Bhagirath for protein structure prediction, and Sanjeevani for computer aided drug design. He has also been the faculty facilitator and founder director of two startup companies under incubation at IIT Delhi. Professor Jairam is the recipient of the prestigious IBM Faculty Award and has been a member and chairman of several task forces and program advisory committees of different funding agencies. I request Professor Jairam to please present his talk. Uh, dear Professor. Dural Panda, Professor Ipsita Rai, and my distinguished colleagues and friends, thank you very much for this opportunity. Let me first share my screen and then I continue talking. Yeah, please let me know if you are able to see anything here. Not so far. Okay. Is this visible now? Not yet. Yes. Are you are you able to see my screen? Yes. Ah, okay. So I'll go to full screen mode. Please make it full screen. Yeah, yeah I did it just now. Is it is it clear enough now? 
Yes, yes, yes. Uh, okay, well, thank you very much. Okay. Awesome, wonderful again. Thanks again for this uh, wonderful opportunity to talk of one of the, the most eminent biophysicists uh, that the country has produced. We are all very proud and uh, very happy that NIPER is celebrating the centenary celebrations. So my uh, association with uh, Ramachandran was very brief uh, in just one lecture. I was passing by at Punjab University and he was giving a guest talk at Punjab University. This was a while ago, early 80s. And his topic was uh, tachyons. Particles which moved faster than light. That was like a bouncer to me. You know, how this man doing Paisa and Ramachandran angle and maps, etc. He's talking about tachyons, right? And uh, I'm sure some of you know that these are very complicated things. You know, so particles moving faster than photons is uh, so difficult to comprehend. Apparently, he was also interested in aerodynamics and uh, how as jets fly by, you know, what happens to to the atmosphere. So that was another interesting topic. In fact, Professor Indra Ghosh to who was his student was telling me that during his last days he was interested in the mathematical structure of Carnatic music. So I can see he was a genius. And so today I have, I'll have the opportunity to say a few things on the maps and how to go beyond the maps. What is the missing link, etc. The the question that that bothered me for a long while was can't we use Ramachandran map to create a tertiary structure of a protein? Why are we stuck at secondary structure and the pruning crystal structures say, well, these are in the allowed regions, not allowed. Use a project kind of a software to say, well, it fits with the Ramachandran map, therefore the structure is good. Well, I think we need we needed to go beyond that, at least in the name of Ramachandran to say, well, we have used Ramachandran, now we have at least attempted to solve the structure prediction problem. So that was the, the, the burning feeling that I had and uh, interestingly you know this uh, I had an invitation to write a paper to JPC and this came up out in uh, December uh, 2014 and at that time my PhD students were Debarati who was trying to do her PhD into the third year and uh, she wanted a real interesting challenging problem and Rahul was a senior PhD student so I, I explained to them what I had in mind as to how do you create a tertiary structure from a Ramachandran map and December is when we had our first discussion. By March, the manuscript was submitted. Amazing. These people were real fantastic, great students, because both of them are doing very well now. They were at the in USA, and Rahul has taken up a faculty position in Abu Dhabi. So I will share with you some of the work that they have carried out in, in this particular context. Now, going beyond this idea of Ramachandran, I had a few more bright students following that, and I will also highlight the the ideas that they generated very briefly so i'm going to sometimes so i'll first talk about the dan one three hour g2 initial very briefly all these things will be very briefly in view of the paucity of time and we will revisit them on some other occasion and our bagira effort for psv i'll highlight where are we today and some milestones in understanding protein structure, the map, Ramachandran map uh, in focus and the convergent problem. I'll I'll present a case where I contend, me and my students of course say that protein folding is a convergent problem and that you have seen in the context of alpha fold that they are routinely able to generate very good structures, right? Unless it's convergent, they wouldn't be able to do it, right? And experimental higher order Ramachandran maps, that is a key to creating a tertiary structures. And beyond that, there are some interesting things that are happening at the amino acid level, which we have not, we have overlooked for quite some time. I will highlight a few of them from my perspective. And then maybe at the end, towards the end, I, this is a, the dream plan that I have that someday, given a sequence, you should just sit down with a paper pencil and then just write down what this tertiary structure is, right? So that's a uh, molecular magic, I call it. I'll touch upon that very briefly. Now, coming to this Danvantari idea, the dream plan is that uh, someday, very soon, uh, the disease is reported at 10 a.m. on a smartphone with all the genome card, etc. 5 p.m. the drug is delivered at doorstep by Zomato, Amazon, etc. And this should be possible uh, no matter what, given the amount of uh, uh, genomic proteomic information that's getting generated and so also metabolomics and, and advances in ML, AI, information technology and some chemistry because you're dealing with molecules and medicine and so on. So how do I proceed to do this? Well, uh, this plan ahead was, I call this as a 
a country path where bullocks carts are passing by. Tomorrow it will be like an expressway, 16 lanes and so on. So it's a country path today and a highway tomorrow. So so you have so you, if you have given me a genome, I will identify a gene here. So the first line here happens to be a protein coding gene, and then I have the protein sequence written. This is very simple to write. So the first step requires I need a genome annotation software, and the second step is pretty straightforward from going from uh, this gene to writing the protein thanks to our Gobind Corana. And now from there onwards, you have a tertiary structure. This is again a protein structure prediction, a grand challenge, so-called grand challenge problem. And then finding a small molecule which will inhibit is the is the drug discovery part. So you have three stories here, uh, the genome annotation part and the structure prediction part and then from structure based or drug discovery part. And of course, now, given the advances in software, etc., it, it, it's becoming possible to create reliable molecules. And if there is no toxicity, if, right, that question, if is still there, no toxicity, the panel of doctors, etc., will examine it and recommend, okay, this is a good medicine, and it's delivered to the patient. Patient is running jogging happily. So that's the overall dream plan. And to accomplish this, what we did was that we created a software called ChemGen. When I say software, these are all actually software suits. There are several of them, you know, at least 10 to 15 utilities, which will bunch together as a software suit. So this does, this takes a physical chemical view, structural energetic view of the DNA at the DNA, and then starts to identify functional elements on the on the genome. And uh, so one of the predictions that it does is to identify protein coding regions. So so once chem genome does a protein coding part, then I move on to the sequence very easily through mRNA. So writing this sequence is pretty straightforward. After this is a big issue of a tertiary structure. So my software is called Bhagirath. For, I'm sure all of you know that bringing holy Ganges from heaven to earth is not an easy task. I used to think like this, except that you know, we now have to revisit this, this name given the new advances from AI and ML. Now, once you have a structure, either the DNA structure or the protein structure, you could utilize a structure-based drug discovery protocol. So, and that software's tools are called Sanjeevani. So this came genome Bhagira than Sanjeevani. Today, my focus we will be on the on a subset of this, this Bhagira idea, right? not, not the whole story of Bhagira. But does this work? I call this entire pathway from genome all the way to drug with entry point anywhere. Suppose you don't need this genome editor. You already have a protein. Well, you can start right here. Right? Or you have just the sequence and then you have to do two steps, right? Bagheera as well as Sanjeevini. So this is called Dhanvantari. Does it really work? So it took us a long time. We established a CIO, I call this as a CIO super computing facility in 2002. And our, uh, we published our first idea of this Dhanvantari back in 2011, 2012. But most recently, 2021, we have done a lot of experimental validation as well. So I'm very happy that finally, before the the 20th uh, anniversary, we managed to push that story. Now, I'll, does it work? I'll just show you how. So one of my colleagues in the School of Biological Sciences at IIT Delhi, he is an expert on HPV, world's expert on HPV. And he was asking me, can you give me a molecule for HPV? And he says, don't focus on polymerase, right? because everybody is looking at polymerase. And so there's some information on already. There are some four ORFs here. And uh, then some FDA approved drugs as well, but most of the drugs are nucleoside analogs. So don't give me nucleoside and also don't focus on polymerase because of the resistance. So then I said, well, because everybody says it takes 14 years and uh, $2.6 billion. So give me 14 years and maybe I'll bargain for $2 billion. I'll make you molecule. More seriously, I told him, give me three hours. I'll give you a molecule. Seriously, three hours? Yes. How do you do it? Well, I go to NCBI website, HBV virus, and I, I download this onto my laptop, complete genome. And now I push this to my chem genome, and it identifies five protein coding regions. Once I have the five, in fact, I can take all of them because they don't share similarity with uh, human proteins, but because my friend said don't focus on polymerase, he was suggesting, in fact, why don't you look at surface protein? So I said, okay, I'll take the surface protein. How does it look like? Well, this is methionine, glutamate, and aspartame, etc. This is our sequence. Once I have the sequence, I push it to Bagheera H. Now, this H has become uh, necessary, not that I wanted the spelling of Bagheera Saint to be changed, 
But Bagheerath was the original lab initial version of the protein structure prediction software. There is H is for a hybrid model. Where there is homology, we exploit the homology. Right? Where there is none, we do the lab initial. So it's a combination of hybrid method, homology plus lab initial methodology. So once I uh, take the, have the sequence ready, then I push it to Bagheerath, I get a nice structure. Then I'm looking for binding factors. And remember, I'm not using any experimental information as of now. That will come later. And since I don't have and so this is like a totally new protein to me and I'm not uh, uh, aware of the binding pocket or the functional binding site. So I'm looking for one, two, three, four, where are the binding pockets in this? Most of the times you know, it's a pocket with the largest volume, but it's not always true, right? So only 70% of the time. So I need to identify all possible binding pockets and probably scan them. Again, it's millions of compounds. Now I'm sure all of you are aware that the zinc database these days is offering 100 million purchasable compounds and you can test them and several other libraries are available now where people have these millions of compounds ready to be tested now obviously doing an experiment with a million compounds on one binding pocket or one protein is an impossible task right so why not use our methodology so sanjeevini now our methodology has an rspd software which is a very rapid screening so i can scan a million compounds again a potential binding site within a matter of minutes which matter of minutes right so now i do this rspd which is freely available by the way whatever software i'm mentioning here today in my talk they're all freely available from this seo by all you need is just type seo by one you'll have all the links and all the stories there so now this RSPD has predicted some shortlisted some molecules. So I take the top 150 molecules using some criteria and threshold criteria. So in fact, my output is in terms of binding affinity like minus 10, minus 11 kkl. So I have a minus 10 cutoff. So that ends up giving me 150 molecules. And now, but this was based on the first binding site predictor, which is which is ranked high in our in our ranking system of the binding sites. So using this, I now go to atomic level docking scoring. When I say atomic level, now I'm turning on the Van der Waals interactions, electrostatic. Remember when I'm doing the molecular, this kind of scanning of millions of compounds, I am not doing docking. That will be impossible, right? You cannot do it in a matter of minutes. You will need uh, super duper computers and lots of days to be able to do millions of compounds. So this is done with a simple QSR-like equation. So I, I look, examine the properties of the compounds which are pre-stored, and I, I already have the protein of information, active site information, which is pre-stored. So it's a matter of setting up a simple QSR equation and quickly scanning the entire million compounds. So then I have Obviously, need to do atomic level docking scoring, and my product in Sanjeevni parallel docking program. So it works on some eight processors, and you get about eight predictions, and eventually four predictions. So this, so it it does give me the binding energies, etc. Beyond this point, what I do is once I further shortlist 150, I come to let us say 30 molecules. I then do an extensive MDs and analysis to take care of flexibility, temperature effects, solvent effects, etc. And and then do a binding uh, free energy post facto analysis of the MD trajectories to finally say, well, here are my molecules. So my job is done, right? Almost three hours and I have the three molecules done. Of course, I did this two years ago. Then my friend Vivek, he did all kinds of tests. Not that he wanted to do all of them, but referees insisted that he did. So finally, this got published. Now I'm very happy that 2021, this molecule 5 seems to work extremely well. And uh, today, I believe, you know, getting a micromolar compound, low micromolar compound, is pretty routine matter using this. Now, ensuring, however, that this is not toxic. In this particular case, this is not toxic. Luckily, we had tested it, and in fact, Vivek was forced to do a lot of testing of that sort right and so but in general a toxicity filter is where we are lacking once we can incorporate a toxicity filter i think we will have uh, we can rely more and more on doing a very limited set of experiments to to cash in on to come up with some wonderful molecules which can work right so that's the idea in fact it was interesting that uh, he he found that the second molecule, that this particular molecule that we had identified was working against a drug resistant uh, virus as well. So then he wanted to write a paper on that where I didn't contribute anything. Then uh, 
I just said, put me in the acknowledgement. He insisted I would like to put you as an author in the paper because how would I have known that this particular molecule can cure uh, res resistant hepatitis B virus as well out of millions of compounds. So I insisted on it. I said, this is not credit to me. This is a credit to the evolving computer aided drug discovery processes. Now the softwares are maturing to a stage where you can start relying on on the predictions. Now, so this is the whole story of Nanvantari. This is one of my students, Ruchika, finally pushed this together. So the Ruchika buddy is my student in this particular case. I know she, she's done the postdoc at USA and she's doing well. So Nanvantari software entry point could be anywhere. And finally, where I am now focusing in this effort is this particular toxicity filter. If I can somehow take care of toxicity, the biology toxicity is not fully clear at the molecular level. There are some uh, speculations on what might be happening, but that's not enough to, to if it has to work every time, you know, I think we need to do more study on that area. Once that is taken care, then you can trust the Nanvantari, Sanjeevani, or any of the softwares that you're seeing. Now, I'll leave this part. Now, I'll focus on just the PSP scientific challenges, not all these three of them, just the PSP, protein structure prediction. What are the scientific challenges which have been overcome already? And and I'm sure I, this, I, I put this slide only for high school students, not for Professor Panda and Professor Ripsita Roy and TP Singh or Professor Ropes. In a simplified view, this for uh, Little of our students you know, who are uh, excited to study protein chemistry. I, I would just call, you know, 90% of the drugs, you know, target marketed drugs target proteins and uh, proteins because, uh, and most of them are inhibitors. That's the general idea here, right? So uh, now focusing on, on structure based drug design. If you had a structure like Professor TP Singh's uh, contributions to the PDB, I'm sure that will extremely a lot of all this. We've done a fantastic work. And if you have a structure, then Obviously, you are ready to do some kind of drug discovery. Again, it's that binding market or a functional site. Now, before alpha fold came in, these were my slides and these were my thought process as to why we needed to think about structure prediction, a computational PDB seriously. Um, all of you know the sequences are going you know, log uh, exponentially, whereas what surprised me at the time was that the fold saturated at around 1400. This was around 2008, and after that, there was very incremental, very little, very marginal increase in these folds. So I, I started worrying. I'm sure the entire community, crystallography community, started worrying. Have we exhausted all folds? Do we have the entire library, or is it that there is there is some catch in the refinement that we are not getting new folds at all? This was like a story. So. That's a big question mark at that time. And now when you see the success of the alpha fold and other machine learning methods, you find that probably crystallographers have done a fantastic job in giving us the diversity that the proteins present in terms of the fold architectures, right? But all said and done, there is a gap and only one software is there which is able to bridge the gap, but otherwise we don't understand it at the molecular uh, level as to how do you get from a sequence to a structure, right? I guess so I was also a proponent of uh, creating a computational word PDB for quite some time. In fact, using this, we have need created a few years ago a computational PDB for an entire soluble proteome of a, this was for a PVX DB and uh, then for its mutant PVX one DB database. So they published a few years ago. This is before uh, the Alpha Force Unifraud exercise, right? But one of my students shared this a couple of uh, weeks ago. You know, this, so this is a, from a, some private uh, LinkedIn thing. Alpha fold can predict structures of 200 million proteins. We now know what every protein looks like. Experimental structural biology is dead. Alpha fold will revolution. All sorts of things. All claims are all over the place. And of course, he put a lot of smileys. But more seriously, no, it has been doing a good job. In fact, I'm very proud that, very happy that we have at least some resource to look forward to in terms of a structure. But the challenge that I still contend for this is particularly for our young, young students and student community in the audience. See, what we, the way science normally the progresses is that you have data, and this is one way of doing it, right? You have a data, and then create information, then to knowledge, and eventually 
and this is done using hypothesis. You create a hypothesis and you validate it. And if it's wrong, you re-hypothesize and you keep modifying, modifying until you find that you're able to validate uh, using your data. And so this is this is our experimentation part. That obviously leads to knowledge and eventually to products useful to society. This is how typically is physics science, uh, chemistry and biology, they all go. But what ML and AI are doing these days is go directly from data to a prediction bypassing this story. Now, so those of us who are interested in what's happening at the molecular level, well, you don't have that option in the bottom one, but you do have that option. So my story today will be on the top line. Well, we do have answers. It's like mathematical exam paper. It's not MCQ, it's subjective paper. If you have a question, if you write the answer immediately without any steps, you'll get a zero marks. But if it's an MCQ, probably multiple choice, you're okay. Right? So we have the answer. We don't know how we got there. Our plan is we want to know how to get there to the answer, right? So, so this does not really mean as in the previous computational structural biology experimentally dead. Nothing is dead here. Everything is alive and kicking and we need to know more, right? So given that scenario, let's move on to the question of Ramachandran. So famously Ramachandran called these angles as phi and psi very nicely because that's where the degrees of freedom are. Next one is a, a peptide bond. So this is a planar and most of the time trans so of course you could assign some value to it but then it's not very much either cis or trans but most of the time it's trans right and then there is a psi chain chi value so if you were to specify the phi psi of a protein I, so i give you a sequence this r r r in a sequence n to c terminal and then i ask you please give me phi psi then you folded the protein basically to a low resolution maybe not a perfect crystallographic match but then you already have a story you know which is conveying overall topology looks very much like it so the challenge is how do we do this phi and psi given this sequence right so that continues to be the theme of this story today right and this has been said several times by various people and using various final models, all kinds of landscapes, etc. That is an open challenge because of the computational complexity. You have innumerable number of possibilities, billions and billions of possibilities, but then you have only one or a select few in near the minimum, pre-energy minimum on this final right that term it is so-called thermodynamic hypothesis so our Bagheera of course I will not go through the whole procedure to tell you what Bagheera does but we have been participating in what's called CASP. CASP is a, a critical assessment of structure prediction that happens every two years and it goes from May to July and they give you about approximately 100 targets and, we, and PDP does not have any of that information so structures are not released in public domain and you're supposed to predict this structure and then mail it back to them. So this goes on. In fact, the interesting story is that this happened during summertime and in the night because you call, organizers are sitting in California and they, their 10 a.m. is our 10 p.m. So my students all come in the gather up in the lab 10 p.m. stay on till late into the night and eight hours are given typically for one particular protein and then you deposit it and then so that's an interesting story every every alternate summer this happens to be there's a mela in the lab in the night time right and wondering why well that they are seriously folding the protein right the latest one happened in May to July thanks to the end of the pandemic my students were really there earlier CAS 14 13 we had serious issues with the pandemic and this time they pushed the benchmark a little higher earlier it was like they were giving 100 amino acid 200 amino acid kind of query sequences so the organizers have the answers either nmr or crystallography they don't release it so you don't know and typically the homology you know so this scores are hardly any homology or sequence similarities are very low with the pdb structure so you're supposed to so these are like computational challenges and uh, of course alpha fold also pro participated in this so average length is like close to 478 amino acids so the big proteins so here my students have run a couple of uh, pictures where the alpha fold structures and the uh, bagheera structures are so close in fact 49 out of 94, that's about 52% of the time we, our Bagheera was agreeing with alpha fold. Remember, we don't do alpha fold. Unfortunately, what happened this time was 
there are hundred servers from all over the world, only one from India Bagheera. That's not the unfortunate part. The unfortunate part is everybody started adopting alpha fold ports into their prediction algorithms. With the result, everybody's structure looks like an alpha fold. So there is no variety. All that innovation spirit, everything that seems to have disappeared, that worried me a little bit. Maybe some people are still holding on to you know the uh, the diverse views you know, to get to the final structure different paths not just ml ai methodology but this time uh, unfortunately uh, that's what we noticed that most of the structures have already integrated alpha fold so, so their prediction is just like the alpha fold if alpha fold is wrong they're wrong right that hopefully it's not there it's not wrong right anyway so there is some more work to do this 50 per two person says there's some more work to do because ours is based on force field so we do energy calculations we use the physics chemistry methods and sampling and stuff like that so i would we, we, we are going to continue of course but take advantage of the of the existence of the structural databases through pdb or through alpha fold now let's focus on some interesting stories on the rules of folding we've been looking at the instructions so I am appealing to you, I want you to take a fresh look at this. Protein folding, molecular level, don't say structure is available, therefore it's solved. No, it's not solved, right? All of agree, agree. It's not solved. Protein DNA, unsolved. Protein RNA, unsolved. Protein protein, unsolved. Watson and Crick and Lalan is planning. Beyond this, what is it that we have solved with regard to the proteins? That becomes a big question. Now, so I started asking, well, amino acids, of course, are our, uh, the language. They are the alphabets of proteins. Are we looking at them right? You know, I keep asking this question. You, know, you may say it's a funny question. So many textbooks have been written, and then they're classified in different ways, right? Residue volume, surface area. They classify them as side chains and so several class, class classifications. Now, given all this, we still haven't seemed to have solved this protein folding problem. What do we know? Well, Anfinsen story sequence to structure that everybody knows. Uh, this is known to us already. And Linus Pauling's uh, hydrogen bonding and backbone hydrogen bonds, I2, I plus 4 here, and then this is a sheet, beta sheet formation based on hydrogen bonds. Every, this is all very clear to us. Right. What else is clear? Well, we have utilized Walter Kosman's hydrophobicity hypothesis, oil and water don't mix. And to give a structural interpretation, structural interpretation meaning that non-polar residues will be inside, polar residues will be outside facing water. This is a conventional, but hydrophobicity is in fact a thermodynamic hypothesis, but we are giving a structural interpretation. In any case, we move on to the next one. This is our famous Ramachandran. So what he said was, well, only part of the space, you know, if you take a phi and psi, and so this was a very nice idea of plotting phi and psi, and then creating a 2D diagram here, two-dimensional diagram, minus 180, and then saying, well, this white space is all excluded, only the dark spots here are the allowed area. So this is a typical Ramachandran plot here. And so if you count the amount of space that's available here, and so it varies of course, depending on what kind of constraints you are using to calculate this kind of maps. Typically 15%, 15 to 25% is uh, allowed and remaining part is not allowed due to clashes so between the atoms, right? Is this sufficient is the question that I'm asking. So we have four ideas now, hydrogen bonding, and Finson, Pauling, Kausman, and Chandan, Ramachandran. Is it enough now to create a tertiary structure? The answer as of now is not enough. It's not good enough to create a tertiary structure. Suppose now you were to go to a higher order Ramachandran map. Now this is where I was mentioning the name of our my bright student Devarati and Raho. So so we had to first establish that this is a convergent problem and you can indeed go to higher Ramachandran and then show how do you do a higher order Ramachandran and then get a structure. So to do this, what we did was we took this phi psi why you have seen this phi psi here, 180 to 180 here, so 360 degrees here, 360 here, and we divided them into uh, uh, intervals of 30, so 30, 30, 30, so you'll have 12 here, 12 here, so I'm calling them as classes. So those are these classes here, C1, C2, C3, C4, etc. those are all the classes. So how many classes will be there? So if you are dividing 360 into 12, so phi, so there are 12 uh, divisions and uh, psi has 12 divisions so you have 144 possibilities so you have 144 classes for each phi there is a psi right so each so each one so for example here c1 minus 60 minus 30 phi and psi that is one class etc what we found was you don't need 144 classes in fact 
you just needed only 27 classes to capture about 93% uh, of uh, most of the residues. And this is based on about 140 million. I don't know if you can see this number here under frequency. We are talking of 140 million residues from PDB, from protein data banks. So I'm extracting this information from our CSB and I'm asking how many residues are, are falling in this class I1, or C2, or C3. So the frequency is given here. And Beer is alpha helix beta sheet. Well, I have that information here. It's helix part. So C1 to C1 cover helix basin. Then C7 here to C15. C8 to C15 is my sheet basin. And then this rest of this coil. These are conventional definitions of sheet, headaches, etc. Right. And so 93% is sufficient to do 27 plus. So now typical experimental map. So instead of doing a calculation to generate pi psi, if you were to take a, a structure from RCSB and plot the pi psi, you're calling it as an experimental Ramachandran map rather than a calculated map, right? So so this is a particular protein uh, with the PDB ID 2Q, etc. So the, the first thing that we decided we should do is if you had a sequence, can you write it down on a piece of paper what the structure ought to be? Now, how do you write a structure on a on a piece of paper? Well, it should be simple if you have converted them into classes because if you have a structure, you can calculate pi psi very easily. And using pi psi, you map them onto the classes C1 to C27. So in this case, methanine, C22, else. So if you were to give me just this kind of a alphanumeric string, you have specified this structure already because the, I can have a simple utility which will convert the classes into a 3D structure, right? So I have taken a PDB structure, and in this particular case, it's a villain headpiece, very small, simple system. And then I calculate the pi side, then I map them onto, onto these 27 classes. Remember, this mapping is a little coarse grain because I've taken a 30 degree interval. If I were to do a 10 degree interval or a 5 degree interval, probably would get even better structure. In this particular case, when I regenerate the structure because of the 30, I've lost some information. But then the structure is not bad, 2.8 angstrom. But it's a very simple way of doing it. So this gives you a way to uh, map a structure from uh, the sequence and pi psi, et cetera, onto a class and from class back to a 3D structure and so on. Now, what is the plan? Well, the plan is, let's go to the higher address. So, so, so remember, whatever we said about 15%, et cetera, these are the, the monomer frequencies. So you take a residue and then you plot, you know, what are the pi psi, et cetera, or are you, say I want focus only on alanine or I want to do arginine. So you're not looking at the I minus one or I plus one. One to the left, one to the right, you are not doing it. Suppose you are to take that part into consideration. I residue and I plus one. So what will be I plus one doing when I residue happens to be a particular residue? So how many such dipeptides will be there? So 20 possibilities here, 20 here. So you have 400 such possibilities, right? So here we superposed on all of them my suggestion is don't superpose because you too much averaging is not good right now what you find is even though we said with the 144 possible classes only 27 are sufficient when you take the i plus one the residue into consideration this 27 times 27 right that is like 729 729 boxes here out of 729 a very little you know most of it is all red, meaning not occupied. Only green part is available to you, right? So you have already done much more shrinkage. As soon as you bring a second residue to the right or to the left, you have reduced the available configurational volume even further. Now, when you go to tripeptides, the meaning you have the I minus one, you have I and I plus one. I, I the residue is of interest to you, and you could have 8,000 tripeptides, right? 20 times 20 times 20, 8,000. And how many classes? 27 cubed, that is 9,683 possible classes. And how many are occupied? So when you analyze RCSB, you find that just about 5,000, right, are occupied. Rest of them are not occupied. They're all vacant. Most of the time, they're vacant. Now, this gives rise to some numbers, simple numbers. What is the story that I'm trying to tell you here? So suppose you were to have a phi psi map, 360 degrees for five, 360 per. So you can create 129,600 cells, right? And so phi is two pi radians, psi is two pi radians. So in terms of radians, this is four pi square. So if you were to have a calculator, put a value of 3.1416 for a pi, this four pi square happens to be approximately some 39 or something. So that's square of multiplied by four, right? About 39. So four pi square is the, is the volume, configurational volume per 
residue, right? Per one, one to the left, one to the right. And now if you added two residues, it will be four pi square to the power of two, right? So I'm here in this bottom table, I'm adding this. So for n equals to one, four pi square, this is in radians, 39.48. When you have two residues, you have 39.48 square. Then three residues, 39.48 cube, and so forth, right? So you are adding, so that is the configurational volume. Now, naturally, this is a freely jointed chain. There is no restriction. They can cr crisscross, do all sides of things. So as you add more and more number of residues here, make a longer oligopeptide to polypeptide, this volume goes to infinity. Now, let us say you go to Ramachandran map and you say, well, 26% of the space is occupied, rest is all blank. Now, you say, people say 15, 17, why 26? This is a very liberal way of you know, attaching it. So, basically, I'm looking at the occupancy in Pfizer space based on RCSB data, 43,000 proteins. I find that for monomer, for GNR chains, about 26% is okay. Again, using a loose criterion of occupancy. Rest of it is not occupied. If you go to a dipeptide, it's 5.42. Tripeptide, 2.43. Now, what is it that I am looking for? I am What I want is, I want 4 pi square to be multiplied by some fraction. And this fraction has to somehow cancel that 39.48 effect. right? So, the denominator has to be more than 39.48. All right. And when does that happen? Let us see. So, if you go to dipeptide 5.42, so that is a fraction. So, now I am multiplying. Remember, it's 5.42, I divided by 1. So, uh, one point. So this is fractional occupancy. So, it's going to be 39.48 divided by 0.265. So, sorry, multiplied by 0.265, right? And then, but that is 10.34. Now, if, if you go again and keep on adding more and more residues, goes to infinity. So, this is diverging. Now, what about the next one? Next one is 2.13. So this first, this is the first neighbor. I'm sorry, this GNR, this is the first neighbor. Zero point, this also goes to infinity. Now I have a tripeptide. I go to the uh, column one, two, three, and four. I, my tripeptide occupancy is 2.43. So when I compute the one over two point, fraction is 0 0.024. When I multiply this 0 0.024 with this 13 and 0 0.48, I end up getting 0.95. This is great news. Now I keep adding residues. What happens to my, so the, I'm calculating 4 pi square F2 to the power of N. N is increasing, my polymer size is increasing, and eventually I go to a single point, right, zero, configuration. That means I have a folded protein at the end of the day, or maybe a basin, right, in this, in this particular, this is in terms of radians, and now you can argue the same story in terms of degrees, but what does this story tell us? It says that if you go focus on a tripeptide, you take tripeptide as the minimum unit in a protein, and if you uh, to convey the language from a structural perspective, and if you focus on a tripeptide and start creating libraries of tetra, tri tri penta, whatever is available, I know PDB is rich in tripeptide, is complete, but for higher order tetra, penta, etc., it may not be complete. But whatever is available, start creating a data and then use your training methodologies. I'm sure you'll do a good job. Now you can give a molecular level explanation. Explanation in terms of this is a typical Ramachandran explanation as to why is this much disallowed, the red is disallowed. That's because of the clashes that I'm showing. I'm writing the oxygen versus carbon, etc., etc. So if you go to dipeptide I2, I plus 1, then you have more clashes shows that is further reduced. So when I say 15% has gone to 2% in a tripeptide, that's because and 2% 2, 2 ensures that your protein converges and the configuration volume does not diverge. Right? So that's the molecular level simple interpretation. Now that you have these tripeptide libraries, do they correlate with the van der Waals? Because we've been saying clashes, does it really work out? Now to calculate it, what do you have to do? Well, take all the 8,000 peptides and generate 27 classes for each of these 8,000 peptides and then compute the van der Waals. How do you do it? We have used a force field, amber force field, to use a 12-6 potential to calculate the van der Waals. And what we are plotting here is occurrences, number of times a particular class occurs and in, in RCSB, versus the Van der Waals energy. So there is a very nice correlation. If it occurs more, Van der Waals energy is more negative, right? More favorable. That's what it seems to show. It meaning that you can go back and forth between RCSB populations and the Van der Waals clashes, etc. Or you can pull, you don't have to relate totally on on a computed values of structure. You could utilize the occurrences in RCSB to start creating structures, which is essentially the 
the consideration that we are seeing in MI and AL based methodologies. It also says that shape and size and dictate, right? Now I have to show a quickly run through maybe in the next five minutes because the next speaker will be ready already, right? So these are some structures, you know, based on that RM to TH tripeptide library. So you create a library. If you give a sequence, then you can look up and figure out first to do the helix sheet coil kind of a classification, then pull out the, the most probable for a structure and create a 3D structure, right? So from database, you create a string and from a string of uh, these classes and from string, you create the structure. Very simple. So this can all be done in minutes though. You don't need heavy duty computing. And now it also shows that because of the database approach, you're not looking at homology modeling. So even if these sequences you know, share 25% similarities, homology modeling, conventional homology modeling fails, whereas this RM2 TS type you know, does quite good, quite well in terms of structure prediction. Now this automatically, I'm sure, hey, explains to people why this AI and ML-based methodologies are working so well. I mean, and this is only for a tripeptide. You know, what they do, of course, is at a fold level, much, much, from all the way from a tripeptide to a much, much larger level. So you would expect much higher levels of accuracy. Now, a few more points on the on the issue of the folding. One of them is that there is a stoichiometry. You know, I don't know how many of you followed this literature from our laboratory that just like you write water H2O, peroxide H2O2, etc. So you have a stoichiometry between these atoms, 2 is to 1, 2 is to 2, etc. or 1 is to 1, etc. Similarly, proteins, they have alanine 7.8, valine 7.1, and the margin of error here is very little, meaning that if you take all the unipart proteins and say, well, how many times does the alien occur if you say normalized to 100? Well, it will not be beyond this two standard deviation, we are writing standard deviation. So this and I'm, we are calling this as a marginal lie. And in fact, my, myself and Aditya Mittal, my colleague in biology, so we did this for some time ago. This was fascinating to us that that all the proteins follow a simple stoichiometry. The stoichiometry is one issue. In fact, one of my colleagues from um, from City University, Mezai, he did random distributions to see whether this is true or not. And he said, well, there is some truth to it. This is not randomly occurring event. It happens to be. In fact, after we did this work, the expressive server created again some stoichiometry. Now this is very common. You find this all over in the literature. And these numbers are not varying very much. So proteins do have a stoichiometry. If you go too much away from stoichiometry, you end up with desired proteins or proteins without any function or sequences without any function. Let's not call them proteins. Another thing that happens with the proteins is that there is a universality in spatial distribution. So uh, this was puzzling to me. So suppose you are sitting on, an, on a valine and you want to know how many valines are there in the tertiary, not, not sequence wise space, but spatial distances. How many you would expect? Well, if I have this valine, I should have more non-polar residues around me. If I have polar group, then I should have more polar groups. That is the simple conventional wisdom, right? That your pocket, hydrophobic pocket kind of ideas. Now, so if you say, well, if I am a particular, we have 400 of them here. If so, if I'm a particular residue, I, how many residues are there next to me? And if you divided them by the number of occurrences, that stoichiometry thing, what you find is all of them fall on the same. So this, for example, this is between two, two lysines. And this is between lysine and aspartate. You would expect lysine to attract aspartate and lysine to repel another lysine. No such thing happens. You know, there is a there is this nice universality in spatial distribution. This is something to ponder over in the context of proteins. Right. Another thing that people keep saying is that non-polar residue will be less and polar residue will be more if you were to do a surface area calculation of proteins. It turns out that polar, this is the top one is the, the, the polar, the second is the non-polar versus the number of residues. Total area, in fact, correlates well with the number of residues, not the polar or non-polar, right? So there is an invariant, that is one thing, metric. Another, of course, is the energy per, per unit, so that is also feasible, right? So that you have a nice, so this is in fact useful for this is our energy function and we are looking at the number of residues in fact this is helping us in doing a lot of predictions one quick point before i go to this magic of um, of, of molecular magic of this protein folding which is coming up in the last two slides 
which is, I keep asking the question, why only 20 amino acids? And then biologists say this, blame it on evolution, very easy, right? So, well, suppose you were to take a mathematical solution approach to this problem, that you have a triangle, equilateral triangle, and you have four sides, and three sides, and you have four colors. So you have four times four cube, 364 possibilities. Out of 64, only 20 are unique because you can rotate, you can flip, you can do all kinds of symmetries on the triangle. So I said, what are these? Let us list them down. So you have RRR triangle, similarly blue, blue R triangle, etc. You have 20 possible triangles. Now, interesting thing is red color occurs in 10, blue occurs in 10, purple occurs in 10, green. Now, and so on. I'll, I'll not go. And any two colors occur only four. Any, right? That's the story. Suppose this has something to do with, and you are saying, Maybe there is a mathematical logic to the evolution of amino acids. Maybe nature has created a set of templates, a unique set of templates, which is complete in some sense. Suppose you are to hypothesize, right? You have to obey all these rules, though, by the way. If you, have, if you do any such hypothesis, you cannot deviate from the rules. So let us speculate. Amino acid side chains have evolved based on four chemical properties. Why am I doing all this? Remember, I, I flashed that slide that people have classified amino acids in so many different ways. Yet, we have not solved the protein folding, protein protein recognition, protein DNA, protein R. Nothing is solved. Maybe we have to think a little bit differently. You know, that is the idea. This could all be wrong. However, textbook may be just fine, right? So, let's see what else. Each property occurs in 10. Any two properties can occur only in four amino acids. Any three properties occur in only one amino acid, right? Is there any property? You see in a biochemistry textbook, Leninger, Strayer, whatever your choice is, none of the properties you know, satisfy about rules. Meaning all this is junk, or probably biochemistry books need to be revised. You know? So now I will show you how. Presence of sp3 gamma carbon. Only exactly 10 amino acids have this. I'm sure some of you who are good with chemistry can easily figure out right? alpha carbon, then beta, and then a gamma. So we are talking about gamma carbon. Now you may say, what is this gamma carbon? When you do an analysis of gamma carbon, you'll find that sheets are dominated by gamma carbon uh, amino acids. Uh, to a lesser extent, helices. Loops very little representation from the gamma carbon. Now you can understand the structural basis of a gamma carbon. Hydrogen bonds donor ability exactly 10 amino acids and again this hydrogen bond donor ability but these amino acids mostly occur in loops less in helices and much much less in sheets and so you're already and now what about this A and B together well they have to occur only four times so that is true KQRT they occur together similarly third one absence of delta carbon you may say this is something to do with the size how big or small etc again exactly 10 and branching linear versus branching exactly 10 so all these are fitting exactly that mathematical model. Now that's not a surprise, right? In fact, using this, you can now pull out inherent, not apparent, not so apparent at the sequence level kind of symmetries. And when you're doing homology modeling, and that's what we publish in biochemistry, we find that this sets a much higher level watermark for homology modeling as well as function prediction. We did this for function using mask blast methodology. So don't do blast in the sequence space, do it in this so-called, I call it as a GDSL space. Now comes the molecular magic. Last two slides, forgive me for overstepping my time limit here. So suppose you are, to, this has been bothering me for a very long time. I would like to write the structure on a paper. I don't want complicated computing to handle me. How do I do it? So suppose you were to look at a polypeptide from the top, and right, and you could be a swimmer doing a butterfly swimming or something, or you just flying like a bird, or looking at a sequence here. So if you're doing, if, if your C alpha is on the, the top here, your right hand is carrying that side chain, left hand is free, only hydrogen atom, right, and you're doing this flying here. Now if it is flipped here, I'm calling this as R, meaning side chain is on your right side, left is, if you're flipping it, it's going to the left side and then to the R, etc. This this is just a definition of this R, L, R when I say, when you're looking from the top. Now what my st students did was to analyze these structures and uh, this is Akshata and Smriti. They are, believe me, they are not chemistry people. They are electronic engineers and computer science specialists, etc. Uh, very recently, another person, Devendra, with an MSc chemistry background, has joined them, but otherwise they've done a fantastic job. They created a proto bench. I will re release it along with this story very soon. So what they did was, so they take a sequence and do this RM to TS, that is Ramachandran map to tertiary structure, and they come up with a with a structure, 3D structure. This is our starting structure from an RM to TS, Ramachandran map. And now, so this is simple classes that you have seen already. 
right for a given uh, story now what they're doing is they're saying well this is the left and these are so these are based on simple mapping of, of what you have already seen the classes etc now from here there we have what we have done is to come up with some, a set of simple empirical rules as of you no know, heuristic rules here so these are being quantified in terms of the gdsl properties that i was mentioning earlier that's sp3 gamma absence of uh, delta carbon and so on so we are going to, we are looking at the residues and using the gdsl as well as uh, uh, the the class and then say well this must be l this must be r so so using that left to right rules instead of one, two, three, four. So we modify the initial assignment and we have a final story. And now what does the structure look like? Well, the structure, modified structure looks pretty much like this. And so, and compared to the crystal structure, this was the original structure and this is a modified structure right on top of uh, the predicted version. So now you can see that this, there is some merit in thinking of simple bird's eye view of a protein with a GDSL kind of a new set of properties and then you can start predicting structure. You may say alpha helix is very easy. What about a sheet? Well, this is a very simple 18, not 35. I'm sorry for the typo here. 18 amino um, acids. So initial structure from an rm 2 ts look like this. Then after modification with this left to right business and this GDSL properties, we have final assignment and then we generate a structure structure looks like this and when you superpose on a native it looks like just for four angstrom initially it was 11 it almost starts to look like okay there is a little spacing here maybe we have not done a proper job of mapping things so this is still 30 degree kind of a, a resolution we could probably do a better structure well summary of the story is i think we are now going towards the molecular level understanding of protein folding or protein structure evolution as to how it's happening so a lot of new ideas are emerging it's not like alpha fold was the end of the story, it's just the beginning that you have structures to refer to, but we now want an answer as to how do you get there kind of an answer. And that's what I was trying to hope, I hope I was able to convince that there is merit into looking at how do we get there, the, the path rather than just the goal, right? The path is equally important as somebody Mahatma Gandhi once said, right? So thank you very much for your attention. So those are, I'm, I think we are, in terms of molecular understanding, we are here we'll get there very soon, right? I'm sure collectively, if not me alone, right? All of us together. Of course, it's not that structure is a whole story for a function. Of course, you do have to accommodate dynamics, but let's not leave out the dynamics. Then Newton is important too, right? Structure and dynamics gives to function of the proteins, right? So those are the nice people who made it possible for me. And as, as Professor T.P. Singh says, my group is all shrinking, but we still have powerhouses here who are doing some fantastic piece of work. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Panda. Thank you, Professor Roy. Thank you, Professor Jaro. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you uh, for the talk and uh, for addressing the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. the alpha fold has taken away the <laughs> structural biology or not. So it's good to know that there's still a lot of in between work to be yes, done. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Agree. But it's very good to know and uh, it's very encouraging to know. Also, the heuristic principles that you've established, the magic that you've shown to bring the predicted structure close to the actual structure, I think that yeah, would yeah. be a great learning. Yeah, I think we're hoping to release that within a month with a proto bench freely accessible from a site. So we'll keep you informed, definitely. Yes, right. Yes, that will be very Thank helpful. You. And congratulations, of course, on the success of Bhagirath. Uh, every task. Competition, uh, the results go on. Yeah, we are, so, uh, yeah, we are pushing, we are pushing, that's right. Yeah, thanks. That's right. Thank, you, thank, thank you very much for the, you. For the opportunity. Yes, and so, thank you so much for agreeing to uh, talk uh, to us today. Yeah. So we will uh, move on. So thank you, sir. Yeah, all so right. Our, yeah, next, thank you. our yeah. next speaker is the one who has probably had the closest association with Professor G.N. Ramachandran. Professor Manju Bansal is currently a faculty member in the Molecular Biophysics Unit at IISC Bangalore. Professor Bansal had the good fortune to have Professor Ramachandran as a doctoral mentor. After completing her PhD on modeling of the triple helix of collagen, Professor Bansal continued working in the same department for a few years. And following this, she received the Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship, which allowed her to work on filamentous phage at AMBL Heidelberg. She returned to the country and joined her alma mater as a faculty member in 1982. In her research work, Professor Bansal combines 
model building, molecular mechanics, and physicochemical techniques to study structure function relationships in DNA sequences. Professor Bansal was the founder director of the Institute of Bioinformatics and Applied Biotechnology at Bangalore, which was recognized as a center of excellence for research and training in bioinformatics in 2008 by MIT. Professor Bansal is also the recipient of the Senior Fulbright Fellowship, EMBL Visiting Fellowship, INSA Young Scientist Medal, and is a fellow of the Indian National Science Academy and the National Academy of Sciences. I'm sure we will have a lot to learn uh, from her on the privileged legacy that she has inherited, as well as the rich research career that she has established. I invite Professor Manju Bansal to please uh, deliver her talk. Thank you, Professor Bansal. This is Dulal speaking. So glad to see you. Yes, really nice to see you too after a long time. Yeah. So I think uh, I'll also st start my shares. Just make sure that my screen sharing is there and then I'll talk. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so thank you, Professor Panda, for inviting me to give this talk. And uh, since I know that one of the reasons, at least for which I've been invited, is because I was the last. And I should also emphasize, in view of the large number of, uh, I'm sure, women scientists present there, that. I happen to be also the only woman scientist who actually completed PhD with Professor Ramchandran, for which actually Mrs. Ramchandran rang up and uh, congratulated me when that happened. And uh, before I get into the science part of it, maybe, uh, as I said, since I'm supposed to also talk about my interactions with Professor Ramchandran, I would just like to say that he was, a, I mean, there's no doubt he was a genius. He was but at the same time, working with him was not very easy because it was a roller coaster of a ride. And as I go along, um, and as I think very few people talk about their PhD work, but as I said, since it was my PhD work, which I did with Professor Ramchandran, I will touch uh, a bit about it and about Professor Ramchandran's legacy before I go on to talk about my work. And as you can see, the title- Please uh, make it full screen. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Is it okay now? Yeah. yeah. So, so before I go on to talk about my own work, as you can see the title of my talk also, I have given as always avoid the beaten path, which was GNR's advice. And maybe I followed it a bit too uh, strictly because after I stopped working, you know, after I completed my PhD with him, I actually have done very little work on protein structures. And uh, I'll just give a little reason as to why that happened. And but one of it was that I think he actually encouraged us to take up new ideas and you know explore different fields, and which was his own forte. I mean, he, as uh, already the previous speakers have shown, he actually indulged and you know took part in multiple kind of different fields in which he worked. And so I almost completely changed my field from protein to nucleic acids, though I did do some work in proteins. So. So as uh, Professor Ramchandran, his name Gopal Sundaram Narayan Ramchandran, and he was my PhD mentor, I joined him in 72 and I submitted my PhD in 1976. So it was by today's standards, it was a pretty quick PhD. And I was fortunate to be able to actually join, uh, you know, publish quite a few papers with him at that time. Unfortunately, he passed away on April 2001 at a relatively young age of less than 80. And now the focus so far and majorly is on Professor Ramchandran's uh, you know, contribution towards protein uh, conformations in terms of uh, you know, the variability and areas of phi psi which are allowed. But 
I, I think I'll, I want to provide a little bit of the context to that. And also because my own work, when I joined him uh, as a PhD student, or rather I was selected by him as a PhD student from the 1972 batch to work with him was to work on the structure of collagen. Now, just in case of, you know, this is just a little bit of an introduction to collagen, so that it contributes 25% of all protein content. I mean, it's the largest protein constituent of all animal kingdom. And among that, the, the what is very unique about the collagen sequence and composition is that 33% of the residues are glycine and 22% actually are pro, amino acids, proline and hydroxyproline. And how they differ from all other amino acids like glycine, alanine, et cetera, are that you know the side chain folds back to form a five-membered ring. So it actually imparts a rigidity to the dipeptide or the polypeptide in which they occur. So apart from this composition, what is even more unusual is that the sequence itself has a repeating pattern of Gly XY, Gly XY among the things which are known. And so this was all that was known in the 1950s about collagen, which occurs either as a fibrous protein or if you heat it, then it becomes gelatin or glue. And so this was what was known, but the structure was not known at all. So when Professor Ramchandran joined uh, Madras University, actually in 1959, uh, sorry, 1949 or 1950, as professor and head of the Department of Biophysics and Crystallography, he was actually wondering what to do because his training had been wholly in physics. He had worked only on you know, small molecule crystallography and theoretical crystallography, actually. And so he was wondering what to do when he was heading this biophysics department. And it was J.D. Bernal, actually, who happened to uh, you know, visit the Central Leather Research Institute, is, which is located next to the Madras University. And uh, GNR were in a conversation with him when he mentioned his dilemma, apparently he suggested that maybe he, since he's, you know, he has CLRI next to him, he should try and explore the structure of collagen, which is a you know, fibrous protein occurring in leather and you know, tail tendon. And as I said, it occurs in a large number of different kinds of tissues in, in mammal system. And uh, CLRI would be able to provide him a sample. So that set GNR off actually on his biophysics structural biology journey. And amazingly, within a couple of years, actually looking at fiber diffraction patterns of collagen fibers, they came out and published a paper in 1954 on the structure of collagen. And in that, they were the first ones then to propose that it is actually a triple helical structure. But what they said was that it is a three residue per turn helix. And you know it has a rise per residue of about three angstrom. And there are hydrogen bonds between neighboring helices Etc. And also, they said that most of the amino acids would occur at one particular position, and the glycine, which is at every third position, would be occurring at a center of this triple helical arrangement. And you know, they would be arranged in a kind of left-handed arrangement uh, with respect to each other. So the C alpha one here and the C alpha one here would be related by a left-handed twist of minus 120 and rising by about three angstroms. Now, subsequently, within the same time or after publishing that paper, they actually had a relook at the fiber diffraction pattern in more detail. And they realized that the structure is not exactly three residues per turn, but it is probably a non integral helice. Now, that is, was a very, very new idea at that time because non integral helices were not actually acceptable to the traditional or hardcore crystallographers which want to have symmetries of threefold, fourfold, five, you know, sixfold, et cetera. There are only certain limited of number of symmetries that they want to, uh, you know, which were acceptable. But it turned out that in fiber, you know, in fiber molecules or helices, you can have non-integral helices. So they had this structure, you know, they had this fiber pattern. And with that, they realized that what you have is that the rise per residue is not three ang exactly three angstrom, but about 2.86 to 2.9 angstrom, and that there are not exactly three residues per turn, but something like either 3.5 if there are seven saturated units per turn, or if there are 10 residues in three turns, then it's about 3.3 residues per turn. So finally, in great detail, when they looked at it, they came out, and this is 
Professor Ramchandran, in one of his classic pictures in which he's sort of pondering over how to relate the well-known alpha helical structure to the collagen structure. And one thing you should notice in this, uh, which is very interesting, is that the alpha helix is left-handed, unlike the, you know, the actual helix you see in proteins, it's right-handed. And so the concept of left-handed helix was also something new. And what he realized but is that in, so the triple helix cannot be an assembly of three alpha helices or anything, it has to be something different. And looking at this, and again, being JNR, he brought in the idea that how, do, how can you have three helices, which then coil around each other to give a non-integral helix of 3.3 residues per turn. And he, in one of his lectures, what he said was that the idea or the explanation he got was from astronomy. And that was that the way the moon moves around the earth and what you see is always the same face of the moon in all the time in the thing. And how does that happen is that if you have a threefold helix and then each of these helices now has a right-handed super helix turn here, and then you still have these glycines inside, then with respect to this center, assuming that the earth is here and this is the moon going around it, you would always have the same glycine residues facing towards the center of the common super helix axis. So this was what led him to then propose a modified structure or three dimensional triple helical coil coil structure for collagen with 3.33 residues per turn. And each one, this is 360. And this again, they published in uh, Nature in 1955. So as, so again, a little bit of this thing that, I mean, to understand and appreciate the immensity of the contribution, uh, one should realize that this was, this was a structure which is much, much more complex than the other structures which have, you know, got almost iconic status and was Linus Pauling's alpha helix and beta turn and uh, Watson and Crick's double helix structure. You know, the first one came in 1951, the second one in 1953. And, you know, Jena, the collagen structures, the two major papers came out in 54 and 55. And, you know, these two were, these two groups were working in Caltech, uh, USA and Cambridge, UK with large groups, with large facilities. And here was Professor Ramchandran with his small group sitting in Madras University and those days there were no computers, no internet, no nothing. And he came out with this wonderful idea to, of solving the triple helical structure. And which is, as you can, from the sheer picture, you can make out that it's a much more complex structure than the uh, Pauling's alpha helix or Watson Crick's double helix of, for DNA. So this is uh, just to show, you know, when I joined uh, the GNR uh, as a student uh, two years later, this is me here, and uh, this is a picture of the molecular biophysics unit. This is all the members we were in 1974 when Dorothy Hodgkin visited the department. And incidentally, uh, you know, GNR had moved to actually IASC Bangalore just in 1970. And as, as was mentioned, T.P. Singh actually had joined in 71, and uh, I had joined in 72 kind of thing but he was in the physics department and I was actually in the molecular biophysics unit. I only had one senior who was uh, working with uh, GNR at that time, and that was Ashok Kolaskar uh, and things. So we were a very small group actually working with Professor Ramchandran. But, uh, and so, okay, so this is the structure of collagen going from primary structure, which is gly, pro -gly and what was that also interesting about the uh, collagen sequence itself was that when small, you know, in those days, what you started coming out was just sequences of small peptides related to collagen. And it was found that the proline, which was occurring in the third position, if you take glycine as first position, was very often, it was actually hydroxylated at the C gamma position. So that is, this is the C gamma position of proline, uh, which is getting hydroxylated here. And uh, it's so from primary, you have this as a single helix structure, and this is the triple helix structure, which assembles and has hydrogen bonds linking the three helices. So the, the problem I was given actually was that though the triple helical structure had been proposed, what uh, was sort of a little bit unknown at that time was it was known that hydro presence of hydroxyproline or hydroxylation of proline at this third, third position, that is glycine, proline, 
sorry, uh, glycine proline, hydroxyproline. If the if this hydroxyproline if this hydroxyproline does not occur here, or if the proline is not hydroxylated, then the melting temperature of collagen is very very low. In fact, it hardly assembles or it, dis, it denatures at a very low temperature. So what could be the role of this additional? And there's a whole enzyme pathway present to actually do this job. So it must have a biological role. So it was thought that it could be happening, uh, you know, it must be helping to stabilize the structure or form the structure. So I was given the task of actually trying to figure out what could be the reason or uh, that, you know, this complex system of pre is present to, you know, hydroxylate proline. and this. And so taking the coordinate system, which had already been proposed from the Madras group, uh, what I was told to do is to look for possibilities of this hydroxyproline forming hydrogen bonds or how it could stabilize. And uh, I was fortunate and, you know, without having any computer training and no programming experience, et cetera, it was a quite a difficult task to do. But, uh, you know, writing programs, et cetera, one was able to uh, try and do it. And what I found finally was that these there were these water molecules which were also supposed to be holding these triple hel these helices together within the triple helix. And what I found was that the, one of the water molecules could actually, though the hydroxyproline uh, hydroxyl group could not form a direct hydrogen bond, the one of the water molecules which was had been proposed earlier by uh, the Madras group to form hydrogen bond could actually form a uh, water mediated hydrogen bond linking these two neighboring chains A and B here. And not only that, because this is this OH group is acting as an acceptor, it can also then have its own OH can then form a hydrogen bond with the neighboring proto, you know, next another triple helical structure and stabilize the protofibril or the actual protein structure. So that's what we, you know, basically what I we showed was. And I was fortunate that almost within six months of starting my work uh, with Professor Ramchandran, we were able to publish a paper in BBA in 1973, which talked about a hypothesis on the you know, role of uh, hydroxyl group of hydroxyproline uh, at location three uh, in stabilizing the structure. And uh, I think, uh, I forget, I think Professor Rose mentioned that GNR was very adept and he was very comfortable, you know, because those days, as I said, there was no computer graphics and even the computational facilities were minimal. So he used to like having these physical uh, Kendrew models. And uh, what since MBU had a workshop at that time, along with the uh, mechanic in the MBU workshop, uh, I was instrumental in actually assembling a collagen model. You know, he made these peptide units and you know these little bits of pieces which lead to the hydroxyproline, and we actually assembled a model of two inches to an angstrom scale uh, to show this hydroxyproline linking the, through a water molecule, a neighboring chain. And I think you you can see here that it gives a very nice idea of the three-dimensional structure. There's one more water molecule which also forms interchain hydrogen bonds, and uh, when GNR left MBU, actually one of the few things he took with him was this model which was in his house in his sitting room for a long time and uh, i was one after he moved to madras i was wondering what happened to it and uh, it was a very pleasant surprise when i visited clri you know subsequently uh, it turns out that they have now he had obviously donated it to clri and they have displayed it in an auditorium at the central leather research institute and the auditorium itself is called the triple helix auditorium and uh, so I mean, this, it, it was very gratifying. But what I said was that this was a hypothesis we had made in 74. And for, so obviously when you make a hypothesis and you're proposing a model until it is experimentally validated, nobody really wants to believe it. And so it was again, unlike a lot of other type of peptides, uh, the crystal structure work, uh, single molecule or atom le atomic level crystallography on collagen tripeptides lagged far, far behind other kind of tripeptides. And it was only in actually something like 1998 or something that the first structures of collagen tripeptides started to come out. And it was only, and finally, it was in 2001 that Helen Berman's group published a paper in which they said that the water in water molecules involved in the collagen tripeptides make a second set of bonds which contact threonine and 
in one of the other tripeptide they looked at, it also said that the contact is with the hydroxyl group of hydroxyproline. And such an involvement of hydroxyproline in water-mediated hydrogen bonds between amide nitrogen and carbonyl oxygen was suggested by Ramchandran, but Nagar and Bansal in 1973. So as you can see, it's more than 25 years uh, that later that our hypothesis got validated, which was again very, very uh, gratifying that this uh, you know, could be shown. But, and, but you know, the, because there's so much talk, as I said, and GNR is much better known for his uh, work on Ramchandran map, uh, I wanted to give a little bit of history behind it that one of the reasons the Ramchandran map didn't come out of just nowhere, or it was not an idea which kind of came to GNR out of the blue. It was a consequence of some of the criticism he faced for his collagen model. So even though in Alex Rich and Francis Crick, they wrote a letter to him saying that we feel that your type of structure is the right lines and the collagen problem has changed completely as a result of your work. In an article that they published around the same time in Nature, they said that in the, in the article I quote, they said that around this time, that is Gina's paper was in 24 September, a paper came out by Ramchandran and Karta, which proposed a coil coil structure for collagen, but it was not possible to build it satisfyingly because of bad Van der Waals contacts and the structure was wrong. And they proposed a a minor modified version of the triple helical coil coil structure. And subsequently it kind of, it came to be associated as a rich and creek structure and which was one of the most unfair things I think which has happened. And also GNR's paper actually was with, apparently it was lying with the nature people for several months and it was delayed just so that, uh, you know, I mean, there's a belief that it was held back so that rich and creek could actually uh, you know, come out with their modified version of the uh, collagen model and things. Now, the positive outcome of it was that, the, as I said, the Ramchandran map idea was not out of nowhere, but because there was this, the only criticism Rich and Crick could make about the collagen model was that some of the atoms were very close together or they were short contacts as the, what we call them now. So that actually was a challenge to somebody like GNR. And what he did was he actually put one of his, uh, who was at that time his student actually, Professor Shashi, who subsequently was Professor Shashi Shekran, to look at the you know, interatomic distances that are observed in crystal structures. And what they found was, or what Shashi Shekran found was that most of the time, you know, the two atoms in any particular uh, you know, crystal or uh, whatever are further apart than the sum of their Van der Waal radii. In some cases, they are within touching distance. In some cases, there is a, but if there's an overlap between the two, that is if the two are closer, considerably closer together than the sum of their Van der Waal radius, then that is a disallowed uh, contact distance between the atoms but they can come a little bit closer together than the sum of their Van der Waal radii because what we are talking about Van der Waal radius is in the gaseous state. So in the where the atoms want to be freely moving around. But if you're looking at it in the solid state or in crystals, they can come much a little bit closer together than the sum of their Van der Waal radius. And they came out with this, you know, what they call as a contact distances, uh, which can, which they observed statistically significant numbers between say two carbon atoms, a carbon atom and an oxygen atom, et cetera, et cetera. And they found that they could be, for example, a CC sum of Van der Waal radius would be 3.4 angstrom. They found that normally allowed very easily, they can be 3.2 angstrom apart. And sometimes if there are other compensating features, they can be even up to about 0.3 to 0.4 angstrom together. And it was using this criteria that they then looked at dipeptide, uh, model dipeptide, and tried to see that if you give, assuming that the peptide bond is uh, considered, you know, uh, just planar and rigid, they looked at variations in these phi psi torsion angles in the uh, dipeptide map. And then as you rotate the dipeptide around these phi psi torsion angles, there are certain phi psi values where two atoms would be hitting each other very badly. 
And of course, this is how the famous Ramchandran map came out. And this is for the alanine residues and what was proposed. This is a recent, you know, this is a later version of the Phi map because, you know, the Phi Psi nomenclature changed somewhere in 1963. And so they came out with this. Uh, this is what we accept as the current map. So this is just showing you the regular secondary structures in the model systems. And this is showing you actually the phi psi in the myoglobin structure, which was the only crystal structure known in 1968, or before 1968, uh, other than uh, hemoglobin also was, of course, there. But they, you know, used as a representative example in this famous review article by Ramchandran and Shashi Shekran in Advances in Protein Chemistry, 1968. So this, of course, the Phi-Sai map itself was published in 1963 in JMB. And, you know, subsequent little bit of refinements were done in it. So as you can see, the Ramchandran map actually was, uh, you know, it was a consequence actually of criticism of the collagen structure. And what was again gratifying was that in 1967, when there was a second, uh, you know, GNR was also very good at organizing conferences. So they had a meeting in 63 and in 1967, there was this meeting where Linus Pauling had come. And uh, one of the points he made when talking about it is that, you know, in 1955, um, Ramchandran and Kartha described the striking triple helical structure of collagen that is now being accepted as generally correct. So as I said, the, in detail, maybe the, the rich and trick structure by reducing the number of hydrogen, direct hydrogen bonds from uh, two to one um, became a little bit looser structure and uh, got rid of the little bit of short contacts which were present in the GNR structure. And what is interesting is he said, although I may have some feelings of regret that Paul, Professor Corey and I did not succeed, I may point out that the problem was a very difficult one, and that Professor Ram Chandran and his co-workers deserve great credit for their successful attack on it. And this was, I think, the final word on Professor Ram Chandran's uh, work on the collagen structures. And so before I go on to maybe my work, I just wanted to then say that what, what is his legacy and current status of what Professor Ram Chandran did? And so the Ramchandran map was derived when no protein structure was available. It has stood the test of time and is a major quality control tool for assessing every protein structure used worldwide. And you know, especially in the, the worldwide protein data bank actually uses it as one of the first criteria to when a protein structure coordinates are submitted. So, and what was good about and what has made it so popular in a way is the simplicity that by reducing complex 3D structures into a 2D representation, the Ramchandran map, map uh, serve as a convenient measure for extracting local structural features of proteins. And the Ramchandran map approach The Ramchandran map approach has been a guide in understanding conformational freedom in other kind of biomolecules such as polysaccharides and nucleic acids, but it hasn't really quite succeeded. Uh, and I'll just come to that. And especially in the case of nucleic acids, I'll try to say why, uh, even though even I myself, we made some attempts to try and create an equivalent thing, but uh, it didn't quite work. And uh, this was again mentioned by some people that what was that what, apart from collagen structure, I thought I'll just highlight his other contributions that he had, of course, the collagen structure papers, famous papers in 54, 55, and then the Ramchandran map, which was, as I said, JMB paper in 1963, and the review in advances in protein in 68. He also continued to work on new methods for crystal structure, his theoretical crystallography kind of work methods for crystal structure analysis using Fourier transform synthesis culminating in a book with Professor Srinivasan in Madras in 1970, just before. And uh, one of his least well-known works in India is his development of the theory of 3D image reconstruction from X-ray radiograms and electron micrographs using the convolution technique. And this was a paper he published with A.V. Lakshminarayan in PNAS in 71 while he was, you know, with, with collaborating with him in USA. And this is one of the, again, 
papers, which is one of the, his most highly cited papers uh, by engineers and people in medical engineering, because it is used today in, you know, when you are doing medical CAT, medical and, uh, science kind of thing, when we are doing CAT scan and uh, uh, 3D image reconstruction from our uh, MRI images, etc. So it was, and after he left MBU, in, unfortunately, he, he kind of retired, uh, you know, in 79 kind of thing. He did a little bit of work on mathematical philosophy, and there he was talking about fuzzy logic and all sorts of things. And so, but not much of biophysics or hardcore structured biology and things. And we, so actually I've been involved in two conferences related to the college, to his work. And one was in 2004, which was the 50th anniversary of the collagen uh, model paper. Uh, so with Professor Sh uh, Shamir Brahmachari, we did a meeting in Delhi in which there were a lot of uh, you know people, including the president and the, this thing who attended. But what I consider even more significant was that we did an international conference in Bangalore in January 2013 to celebrate 50 years of the Ramchandran map. And it was attended by more than 700 researchers and uh, you know more than uh, 50 international scientists and uh, Professor Ro actually Professor uh, Rose, who was the first speaker and gave such a wonderful this thing about the Ramchandran map, he was to be uh, one of our speakers, but he couldn't make it. But uh, this thing, so this was actually Professor Sienna Rao uh, addressing the 700 odd audience in, uh, when we had this meeting in the uh, Tata Auditorium in IISC. So this is uh what uh, you know gnr's uh, history behind gnr's work is and apart from what else he mentored us about uh, one thing which i always remember when i think about gnr was of course one reason we could finish our phd in four years and you know publish so much because that he did push us a lot and uh, one of the his ways of uh, dealing with us was he'll say he'll ask us to do something and then he'll say okay take your time uh, you can show me the results by tomorrow morning or something and which in today's day and age with in spite of all the facilities i can't even dream of asking my students to you know show me some results by working overnight but i think all of us who worked with gnr were pushed to do our utmost and i think it helped us to work hard and think the other thing of course was uh, as i said to ask questions not to accept dogmas and published papers as being the gospel truth so in proteins, as I said, I haven't done too much work on protein, but one of us uh, questions which we were looking to answer uh, was that, how do you identify rare helices in proteins and their functional role, if any? And that was, so one of my students, uh, what we decided to do was to look at the geometry of proteins. I mean, this is actually the mathematics is based on a very old paper by uh, Go and Sharaga, where you know you take, you, you don't take a single helix axis and fix, a, you know, treat it as a monotonous kind of a helix, but you work out the geometry of four successive C alpha atoms and try to say whether you can have a mini helix defining those atoms, and then of course you look at their positions and their geometry. I won't go into the mathematics of it. It's not very complicated, but basically you're just drawing perpendicular bisectors to the vectors and working out the local helix axis. And when we do that, what we found was that if, not, if I now calculate the twist and the rise for these mini helices in the protein, known protein structures, and which in this case, we had a data set of about 102,000 uh, data points, it actually describes this kind of a plot. And then we did a k-mean clustering. This was my student, Prasun Kumar, who did this work. And because we already had developed, my other earlier student, Sandeep, had actually developed a program which allowed us to do these calculations. So Sandeep essentially used the program and came out with this. And what we found was that you get seven significant clusters. And of course, the you know we have the common ones which are like you know it starts with a 310 helix and then we go to alpha helix and then we go to as we go along we see these 2.27 helix then you have the proline polyproline left-handed helix you have the extended sorry extended structure you have the polyproline helix 
and you have the this thing, and then you have the left-handed alpha helix kind of thing here. And so this was actually interesting because what it said was that even though alpha helix and beta strand are the most common structures, you do have, and you can see that from the population numbers which are here, if you can read them. And there are other structures which are present significantly in the uh, protein. This, and so when we then try to look at those structures, as I said, the most common ones, what you have, as I said, is alpha helix and is the most well-known one, and beta strand is the other, you know, the two most commonly occurring ones. But you also have significant numbers of 310 helix, pi helix, and polyproline 2 helix and left-handed helices. And in addition to that, you have this 2.27 helix, which again, I think Professor Rose has talked about it in one of his papers, that it acts as an intermediate actually between uh, various kind of you know, structures. And in the Phi map, it lies in the, um, you know, in the partially allowed region of the Ramton map. So since we found significant numbers of other helices also, and so this was actually, as I said, the pi helix here. So we, uh, Prasun then went on to actually analyze all these distinct structures. And since some of them were already well known, he actually concentrated on the pi helix and the polyproline helix, which was of my interest since it's related to collagen. And he published several papers on each of these. So I'll just mention a few things about, okay, yeah, these are actually showing you what were the average twist and rise for these helices, which differ a little bit from the theoretical models which were known from the uh, structure. For example, the alpha helix is, uh, you know, in the actual cases, you do see some variation from the model structures values. And so this is again sh just showing you the 310 helix and alpha helix, a pi helix, and a polyproline 2 helix. And since alpha and 310 had already been reasonably well studied, he concentrated on looking at. So I'll just present a few cases of pi helix to high. Because this has actually been, uh, before we published this paper in 2015, there were hardly any papers which even, even from crystal structure analysis, very few people talked about pi helix. Uh, where subsequent to our, uh, you know, uh, providing a way of actually using our Helenal program uh, and providing a way in which you can actually calculate the parameters, vari variation in the parameters along a helix, and so you can identify these uh, small, uh, you know, various differences from the alpha helix. Uh, several people have now started identifying pi helices actually in their protein structures. And so this is just showing you pi helices at a, you know, C terminus, at the N terminus, in the middle, in these, and then, you know, again at the C terminus, and, a and an independent whole helix, uh, which is a pi helix. And this is one of the longest pi helices, which as you can see is 12 residues long. Uh, here. And what could be the reason why an alpha helix, which is undoubtedly the most stable structure, which takes up this variation, is because it is uh, found that when you have, you know, a, a, a change from alpha to pi, actually either increases or decreases the length of a pi helix, because it gets pulled out, or it also, you know, facilitates some kind of a ligand binding to that. For example, here, you know, is a case of a pi helix, and you have two different ligands binding here, or three different ligands binding here, and it it binds always to this pi helix region, causing this kind of a distortion. And so this is one of our programs, ASSP, which actually shows you this variation of alpha helix, and then you have. So in the first case, actually, it is just a stretched out structure, but in these two cases, it's actually a pi helix, which is interacting with these bromoethanol and bromohexane, et cetera. So it facilitates, and the from stretched out un, unstructured region, it becomes a pi helix on ligand binding. And similarly, there, there are cases where you have replication initiator protein, and you know it it makes occurrence of the pi helix makes the interaction with DNA actually to be better. If it is a if it continued as a alpha helix, it would not be able to the, that protein would not be able to interact with the DNA bases in a nice way. So it is kind of showing you this arginine, which is one of the most common residues for interacting with DNA, uh, being facilitated by the pi helix. And uh, so it sort of moves from here to here, and it's able, the arginine is able to interact with the DNA. Okay, 
So now I think um, I'll just spend the next uh, half uh, of my talk on uh, my work on DNA. And since I spent more time on proteins, I may cut out some of these slides which I have here. So again, in line with what Professor Ramchandran had taught me to think about uh, was that is, you know, like Watson Crick DNA by then had become an iconic. Watson Crick had got a Nobel Prize and it was, you know, a dogma that uh, in vivo DNA is a double right-handed double helical structure. Uh, so, but when I finished my, around the time when I completed my PhD thesis, uh, Professor Shashi Shekran in, in this molecular biophysics unit, who had also who was also GNR student and who had moved with him from Madras to Bangalore, he had started looking. He had concentrated on nucleic acid structure, and he had started looking at possibility of having left-handed DNA structures. And that was a blasphemy at that time to think about it. But because just I think it was so controversial, and since Professor Shashi Shekran asked if I would like to work on DNA structure or nucleic acid structure with him. I actually jumped at the chance. So instead of continuing my work on proteins, which would have been a lot more easier, I took up this uh, challenge of working on DNA structures. And the structure and the questions we asked at that time, or Shri Shekran asked at that time, that is it always a right-handed double helix? And it also subsequently what I addressed myself was, is it, always, is it a uniform Watson Crick double helix, even if it is a right-handed double helix? And this is just again to give a little historical perspective because all the earlier talks were talking about protein and so i thought i should talk about dna uh, i could have spent more time on my other protein work but i think i decided to talk about dna so this is now a model just like i showed you the collagen model sitting in clri in chennai uh, this is a model of the double helical watson crick model and this is watson and this is crick and it is sitting in the LMB laboratory in Addenbrooke's hospital, in uh, which is, you know, the LMB is now what's in Addenbrooke hospital. And this is in Cambridge. And in, they proposed the model in 1953, but they never actually published any coordinates. So nobody could point out mistakes in their model, which subsequently people have realized that the torsion angles that they had used in their model were not quite correct because they would lead to short contacts. And uh, of course, within less than 10 years, they got a Nobel Prize for, along with Wilkins, Morris Wilkins, uh, uh, you know, for their work on DNA model, DNA structure. And once they got the Nobel Prize, the double helix acquired an iconic or canonical status and nobody could question it. And uh, again, I would like to point out that Watson and Crick got the Nobel Prize and Wilkins, who was at King's College uh, London shared it because the person who had actually done the work, which was Rosalind Franklin, she was the one who had actually done the crystal fiber model or fiber structure or fiber pattern, X-ray pattern of the collagen, uh, sorry, of DNA, uh, in the, especially the B form, uh, which was at 90% relative humidity. If you take a DNA fiber and do an X-ray diffraction pattern, you get this kind of an X-ray pattern. And those of, I mean, I'm sure none of you know how you interpret this, but for somebody who's familiar with X-ray crystallography or fiber diffraction crystallography, it is very easy because if you count these layer lines as they are called, this is an equator and one, two, three, four, five, it goes out and then six, seven, eight, nine, ten, it comes back. So this is a very clear indication that it is a 10 residue per turn helix and it is an anti-parallel helix from the pattern you can make out and that the rise per residue is about 3.4 angstroms. And, uh, but Rosalind Franklin herself, when she published this X-ray pattern, they also had a much more crystalline pattern. And the reason actually Rosalind Franklin was not able to solve the structure because she was concentrating on this pattern, which was called the ADNA X-ray pattern. And it has a lot more data as you can make out. So she concentrated trying to solve it. But this is, for a fiber, this is a lot more difficult to actually interpret. But it turned out that this is just a variant of the BDNA, except that it has 11 residues per turn and the 2.56 rise per residue. And, uh, but it's a more well-packed structure and that is why you get more uh, spots in this pattern. So, okay. So when the DNA structure was proposed in, by Watson and Crick in 1953, already by then it was known that in addition to the BDNA, right-handed BDNA pattern, there was a variant of it called the ADNA. And subsequently in the 1960s, 
other variants of the bDNA, ADNA, like cDNA, dDNA, et cetera, came out. And so when we started looking at left-handed DNA in the 1970s, there was nothing, no experimental data to support that. And the reason why left-handed DNA structures had been ruled out was again because of short con possible short contacts in the if you try to build a left-handed double helical model. But while we were still working on it, and we were with great difficulty able to publish a couple of papers on left-handed regular DNA, showing that the X-ray pattern is not very dif different from what is predicted. The predicted X-ray pattern is not very different from what is available in the literature. Uh, you know. It was only in 1981 that the first left-handed crystal structure came out uh, from, again, Alex Rich's group, who had by then moved to MIT. And they came out with this. And the only difference between what we had proposed and what was there in the structure was this is a left-handed structure with a dinucleotide repeat unit. So you can see here that here, if one chain is going up, the down chain is, but all are right-handed. Here, you, if, this is a left-handed fashion that it is going out here. So this was a left-handed double helical structure with two residues per repeating unit. And the sequence which it preferred was if you had CG, 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 and it had to be a high salt concentration kind of a structure. So in vivo, it was still thought that it is the BDNA structure which is present. So, but once the structure came out, and even before that, people had been looking at other structures. And what was known is that in addition to the right-handed structure, there had been suggestions from synthetic, small synthetic uh, polynucleotides that you can have, you know, you have these holiday uh, sort of arm structures where you have the stem loop structures jetting out from the double helix. You can have a triple helical structure and you can have a, a you know, quadruplex or a G tet. If you have runs of Gs occurring in the sequences, you can have a G quadruplex type of a structure. So you have a left-handed zigzag, apart from BDNA right-handed, you have zigzag ZDNA. You have a four-arm cruciform structure or called the holiday junction and type structure. You have a triple helix and you have a quadruplex structure. But what was still not, it was known that it must be happening, but still not so well known is that if you're looking at even double-stranded right-handed double helix, what is the structure nice and just uniform linear here? Now we know that the DNA wraps around the histone core and takes up in nucleosomes, for example, here. And during both transcription and replication, it has to open out. So how does that opening out occurs? It has to be, and it occurs at specific locations. So it has to be some kind of a variation in the properties of the double helical DNA structure. And so that is subsequent to, you know, I spent quite a bit of time looking at these kind of structures. But somewhere along the way in the 1980s, when I started my independent lab, I got more interested in looking at the sequence dependent uh, variation of DNA structures. In, uh, in, and uh, so we looked at several properties of that, for example, in the meltability regions and in the, you know, how does DNA wrap around the nucleosome and doesn't, or can DNA be intrinsically bent rather than straight? And okay, this is just a summary of that, you know, 15, between 1992 and 2001, we were looking at uh, duplexes, triplexes, quadruplexes, et cetera. And uh, we had about 15 papers on that. But what, in 2001, when the genome project started off in full swing, what we found was that it is a whole variation of uh, structures are by then had been available in the literature. So one of my students, Anirban Ghosh, we did a literature survey of it. And, you know, just uh, as I said, when 1953 was 50th anniversary of the DNA structure. And what we found was that, you know, DNA structures were being ident you know, identified and being characterized in a number of ways. And you had structures called A, B, C, D, et cetera, and going right up to Z DNA, as I said, the zigzag. And there were only five letters in the English alphabet, which did not have a DNA structure associated with them. And so if you include the BDNA here, then that means there are 20 structures other than BDNA, which have been reported in literature. But when you, by then, since crystal structures have started coming out or of oligonucleotides have started coming out, it became very clear that even within a given oligonucleotide, you have variation in the DNA structure. And it is more relevant to talk about the you know, uh, micro level description of the DNA 
oligonucleotide structures or DNA sequences per se. Uh, rather than talking about the whole structure being A, B, or C, one has to look at the dinucleotide step structures. And since many structures showed you know, mixture of these different geometries, and before one starts calling the whole structure as a new structure, one should analyze the structure in detail. So, and in addition to that, since the gen genome sequences had started coming out, as you know, the first nature paper came out in 2003 of the full genome, human genome sequence. But before that, you know, E. coli and some of the bacterial systems, as well as yeast sequences had been determined. But when the human genome sequence came out, to everybody's great surprise, it turned out that out of the whole sequence of 3 billion base pairs, 98% of it was actually non-coding DNA. And so it was Michael Snyder at Stanford who made this comment, who said that stretches of molecules that don't produce proteins, and Crick had famously called them junk, they are the ones who actually shape who we are. And so the blueprint of life is not all about genes. And these non-coding regions must play a regulatory role as promoters, enhancers, introns, et cetera. So the question uh, my group asked at that point of time was that apart from nucleotide sequence, can differences in structural properties of non-coding, for example, promoter regions versus the coding DNA sequences at whole genome level be used to characterize promoters and be correlated with gene expression uh, levels? So, this was a completely different area. And I mean, it was basically moving from chemistry and uh, structural biology to actually hardcore molecular biology. So what we looked at was various properties of nucleic acid, because by then my lab, we had already developed an algorithm and a program to actually analyze an oligonucleotide structure in terms of geometry of dinucleotides. And so we are looking at various dinucleotide features. DNA, the ones we concentrated on was DNA duplex stability, dinucleotide features, and flexibility. And how do you define, just like, you know, in the case of DNA or nucleic acid in general, because we have six, okay, I have not see, shown you an oligonucleotide geometry, but what happens is because you have six torsion angles as against three in proteins, it's very difficult to draw a Ramchandran map kind of an analogy because you would have to consider all pairwise kind of combination. But what turns out is that in the case of DNA, more than the backbone, it is the relative orientation of these base pairs, the Watson-Crick base pair geometry, which kind of turns out to be more important. And you can, taking these base pairs as planar entities, uh, you can describe their relative orientation in terms of three rotations, which is twist, roll, and tilt and three translations, which are shift, slide, and rise along x, y, and z, z axes. And so, you know, looking at these properties, which I mentioned earlier, stability, bendability, and also intrinsic curvature. And why they are important? Because stability is important for the DNA double helix to, the two strands of the DNA helix to come apart so that, you know, your RNA polymerase or DNA polymerase, RNA polymerase in transcription and DNA polymerase in replication can access the regulatory regions where transcription and translation has to start. Then also bendability or flexibility is important because this is where, you know, in, to wrap around the nucleosome, you need to have some kind of a variability in that and how does it start there? And this is also, you know, with respect to trans. So since we were, I, we decided to concentrate on transcription regions of DNA upstream of the transcription start site. And then we looked at also the intrinsic curvature because especially in eukaryotic DNA where you have to, you have, you know, regulatory regions occurring very far apart from the start point of transcription. Uh, so you also need to know whether intrinsically that kind of DNA can bend and also be facilitated by having interaction with the proteins. And so, I'll quickly just go through this. That is, if you take dinucleotide, then the stability has been determined through oligonucleotide studies of the 10 unique dinucleotides. And given a sequence, you just scan along the sequence and plot their relative stability of, say, 20 nucleotide or 30 nucleotide windows. And you find that if you take 500 nucleotide upstream and 500 nucleotide downstream, you get a variation in these stability regions. And close to the transcription start site region is always less stable than either the upstream or the downstream coding region. So, and depending on how rich 
for example, in the bacterial system, depending on the GC content, you always see this low stability region upstream of the transcription start site, but the baseline itself increases. So we worked out a scale of it and we kind of tried to see if we can predict. But this property of having a low stability region upstream of the transcription start site, it occurs universally across prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So what we wondered was, can we use this duplex DNA's relative stability and bendability for doing a promoter prediction? And you know, quantifying it through doing a recall precision. That is, you know, if it is in the coding region, prediction is false positive. If it is upstream of the uh, transcription start site within 500 nucleotides for prokaryotes, it is a true positive. And looking at a database of about 900 and now subsequently at 1,300 nucleotides, what we found was that you get a very nice uh, statistical uh, agreement for predicting the. Uh, you know, promoter sites in DNA. And so we get 72% recall and 56%. And what was even more interesting is that RNA genes, for which there is no motive prediction programs, uh, we found that about 70% of them, for, even for RNA genes, we could get a promoter predicted, which matched with the experimental predictions. And, you know, there was a database, from, from based database developed, uh, which one can go to and look for promoter regions in all the possible available uh, promoters, you know, in all the available genome sequences of prokaryotic bacterial systems. Then we did go and look at the eukaryotic system and surprisingly to, I mean, I would say to my surprise, we found that if you look at 46 different eukaryotic systems ranging from fungi, worm to mammals and birds, we found a similar but not identical kind of stability variation even in them. And when we do a promoter prediction for them, again, one finds that the prediction is even better. For yeast, for example, it is 86%. For worm, it goes down. And then for mammals, again, it is around 77%. As against prokaryotes, which were 60%. So this was very reassuring. In addition, what we found is that we get a better prediction or more number of correct predictions when you have the, if the gene is more responsive, essentially what it means is that the promoter is a stronger promoter. I can't go into details of definition of promoter, strong promoters versus weak promoters. But what we do find is that you have, a, you know, more likely to predict a promoter if it is a strongly or more responsive kind of a promoter uh, for a gene. And so final thing was that we could apply prompt predict successfully for predicting promoter regions in prokaryotic as well as you know plants also we've done and uh, though it was initially defined for prokaryotes so it's a property across all king living kingdoms and it is also able to predict more responsive genes more reliably uh, than less responsive genes and I think I'll skip this part because this is talking about the curvature property, but I think I'll just skip this and go to the last part. So this is then, uh, so we did promoter prediction. We looked at, apart from stability, we looked at other properties and found that we can correlate them also with promoter regions. So then we wanted to see whether the, is it just the region which is binding? You know, when you're looking at, how does transcription start? You have transcription factors which bind to DNA. And so then, it was thought initially that it is again a chemical interaction between the transcription factor and the DNA base sequences which causes it. But what we wanted to look at is that do structural features and flexibility of the, not just the exact binding sequence, but also of the flanking regions or neighboring regions with determined transcription. And what are the mechanisms affecting transcription factor binding beyond simple binding site specificity? And so we looked at three different systems zinc finger, homeo domain, and leucine zipper systems, uh, which have varying, so they all have a little bit varying motive, but they all have alpha helices actually binding to the, uh, the, the binding of the, the protein region is always an alpha helix, and which is recognizing DNA, but the way the alpha helices are arranged in the homeo domain is, uh, for example, you know, this way, and zinc finger is, you know, it's a series of actually alpha helices which bind, I'm just showing one, and then you have the leucine zipper where you have two identical kind of almost helices sitting in successive groups uh, binding to the DNA. So if one then, uh, so for this, we had actually experimental data available from a Siemens Aries lab in USA, where 
what he did was he took the common binding sequence and fl put flanking sequences which are very different from each other and or all possible flanking sequences of formers and looked at their binding affinities available to that. So what we tried to do was that if we look at the flanking region and we calculate the uh, structural property of the flanking region, do we see a uh, variation? And so this is again a bioinformatics type of work where we looked at all these possible uh, former sequences flanking the DNA uh, consensus, same consensus sequence or identical sequence and try to see correlation with all these uh, 11 properties of uh, DNA. And what we found, for example, I'm giving one example of the GATA4, which is the zinc fungal binding protein, is that you see distinct peaks in the affinity scores. And if one looks at what are the ones, so these are the tri flanking trinucleotide, which are shown here along the x-axis, and you see that there are distinct flanking sequences and which are binding strongly as compared to the overall baseline binding. And it turns out that you see highest affinity is when you have 80 rich flanks, both at the five prime end. And so these are the 80 rich sequences in blue, which are sticking out here. And you have in the three prime flank, same 80 sequences sticking here. The reason they look different is because the way, you know, you're going five prime to three prime in the DNA sequence. And so we did that for all the three systems I mentioned earlier, and we were able to publish this work in nucleic acid research and it's got a good feedback from many people because hardly anybody had been looking at flanking sequence. So we had variation affinities. And as I said, we looked at the various properties like free energy, wedge, uh, nucleosome preference binding, wedge. So these are the 11 properties I was mentioning earlier at five prime flank and three prime flank, and we found that the zinc finger motif inserts into the major groove at five prime end. And it is always, as I said, the property which is associated with it is that when five prime flank is 80 ridge, when it is lower free energy, it has a lower wedge angle and a negative propeller twist and a narrow minor groove. So these are four properties we were able to pick out and you can see that the binding affinity is increasing as these properties are showing an increase here. And my, minor group width is becoming narrow in the case of DNA, which is coming out here. Okay, so this is the you know alpha helix sitting in the minor group of the DNA, which we are talking about. And so the conclusion was that, you know, structural features of DNA sequences, which flank the consensus sequences are also well correlated with DNA TF binding affinities and the structural, feature preferences of flanking sequences are unique for each TF class. I have not presented the results for the other classes, but they all show correlation with some property, but not with the same properties. So they can, the, you know, the structural features cannot be generalized for, for one set of protein, it is one class. And, and the high affinity flanks make the consensus site more conduct, conducive to recognition and binding. So the bottom line is that structural properties and flexibility of DNA flanking a consensus motif significantly impact transcription factor binding. And so to conclude, uh, you know, take home message again to come back to GNR actually, apart from, you know, doing all his science, he was actually a poet. He was an excellent singer of Carnatic music. And as I said, he was working on mathematical philosophy when in after leaving the uh, hardcore biophysics type of work. And so one of the poems, which is, you know, if, you, if any of you have access to a biography written by Raghupati Sharma, you know, and published by Indian Press, there are many of his poems which have been reproduced. And I like this one the best in which he says, because it, if you wish to explore a new, always avoid the beaten path. And this is where I have taken the title of my talk, avoid the beaten path, swinging ahead on avenues new. Okay with zeal, brain, brawn, both. And then he goes on to say other things also. And I think it was, it encapsulated his, you know, approach to science and what he taught us as a mentor. And to conclude, I would just like to thank, uh, these are multiple group photos with my students at various times. Obviously a large number of them have been involved in it. I would also like to thank Professor Srinivasan who unfortunately passed away last year because some of the Ramchandran map pictures uh, slides are from him. And of course, funding agency, DST, DBT, CSI, and my MIT. And okay, I think this is. 
So thank you, everybody. And uh, I know this talk was different from other talks, but I hope you appreciate. I did want people to appreciate the DNA also exists and not just only proteins. So uh, and uh, I wish we could have a Ramchandran map for uh, DNA, but it still looks in the I mean, unless we start representing things in six dimensions, it may be a bit difficult to get a clear picture from a two dimensional map. And thank you, everybody. And thank you, Dr. Panda and Dr. Roy for inviting me. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, it was a very enlightening talk for the simple reason that the way a student looks at a PhD supervisor is much different and carries much more information than how a scientist looks at a scientific colleague. So your uh, impressions of Professor Ramachandran are I think, very, very, uh, not useful, but uh, relevant to the topic that we have. Also your uh, work that you have described, I think the courage that it has taken to challenge something, challenge the canonical form of DNA and then to work on it further uh, and uh, the database that you applied for uh, determining promoters, the importance of flanking sequences that you have shown. I think all of these together and also the fact I'm especially thankful that apart from what we know Professor Ramachandran's fame as Ramachandran plot and his collagen structure, that you've also highlighted his work with the 3D image reconstruction as well as theoretical crystallography. That is something uh, it's worth knowing. It's worth knowing about uh, the multiple facets of his personality. So I'm really thankful, really thankful to you for your presentation today. Thankful. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Professor Bonsal. Uh, yeah. I would like to take this opportunity uh, to place my sincere gratitude to all four speakers, Professor George D. Rose, Professor T.P. Singh, Professor B. Jairam, and Professor Monju Bansal. Uh, we are all delighted that you made this uh, event uh, very uh, learning and successful. I'm really indebted. Uh, I hope some point you all will be able to visit our institute. And I really thank from the bottom of my heart for taking the time and uh, getting us educated. And this is one of the most cherished dream of Indian science. No doubt is, you know, unbelievable contribution. So thank you all again. And, uh, if anyone wants to add anything, say. I, I, I would just like to end by saying that I am especially thankful to the director uh, because he was the one who contacted all these speakers. Uh, and I'm also thankful to my colleagues and students within the department and within the institute for uh, being here today and the computer center for providing service for the webinar to be conducted so smoothly. I'm very thankful to these speakers. That goes without saying uh, that they were able to spare their time because uh, it's not simply to say that they were able to spare their time. Like for Professor Bansal, uh, she has an ongoing symposium, but she still found time to address us and uh, give the lecture. So uh, I'm, I'm really thankful. So thank you, everybody. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Thank you. We'll see you sometime. Yeah, see you. Bye bye. See you. Bye, TP Singh.